Oh, what a day. Honestly. Right, here we have a lovely old... Ooh, some funny fitting holes there. Some lovely old... Some lovely old... Fender made in Japan. Stratocaster in ash. Look at that lovely ash. Huh? Delightful ash. It's two piece or three piece? One, two, three piece. It's got a... Well, it's not a neck through, but it's got a central piece down there. Um, this is Larry's, and it's got um, Mighty Might. Those things that make noise, pickups, and uh, it's got some slightly rusted saddles. And we've already decided to replace these with brass because one of these, or maybe two even, are sh what's the word? Mm, 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 corroded in place. And so we'd have to destroy them to get them out, um, destroy the grub screw, and then we'd need a set of grub screws, and these are a bit high anyway for the target action we're going to aim for. Uh, so we opted for a set of these brass saddles, which you'll see at a later point in this video. So this is going to be straight on into this guitar, um, crafted in Japan, one of those nice era types. Quite a low serial number on the A scale, uh, 1017. Um, yeah, lovely looking thing. A bit of old, ooh, corroded, corroded, no, a bit of old sticky oil on the tuners there, which ain't so bad. Um, we'll see how they turn. So this is coming in for uh, a refret and, and setup. Now, what's interesting about these frets is, I don't know if you can see here, so they are, they're not, they're not done the American way. So the the fingerboard is done, finished, and the frets are added on top of the what in this case would be a sort of semi-gloss, maybe mostly gloss fingerboard. And so they there's no telltale kind of crumpling of the finish over the frets as you can see there. So this is this is what, I mean it's nice. I like that. Also, um, I'm not immediately nervous because it's Japanese. I'm not expecting uh, a load of finish to fall off, although there is a little bit of chip out here from a previous time. That presses in a little bit there because the frets have been pressed hard, I think, to get them in. But um, it's it's not the American style. And I've been seeing the American style, and um, we'll see it in the next couple of days, on um, Justin's Made in the US Strat, um, which has the blanket type of thing. And I've been talking about over the last few days because I've been posting about that type of fret or finish application. So what the, what the Americans have done for a long time, and I don't know when it started and when it finished, so let's not get into that. But anyway, so there's your frets on your fretboard, all perfectly spaced. And uh, what the Americans do is they come along and they go spray, like so. And they make a carpet. And that's your fret spraying done. And then they come along with a file, or some sort of file, and they go nip, 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 and they snip off, or they've polished the top of the frets. And in doing so, they snip off that bit of carpet going over the frets. But you can see already, you've got a weakness, okay? Um, <coughs> excuse me. And you've got a weakness, which is there, and there, where it's broken. And so on and so on. Um, normally that's okay, it doesn't sort of go anywhere much. Um, although somebody who rang me today <coughs> talked about his, his frets, because the carpet sort of traps the fret in, it, it captures sort of bits of gaps of air there, and his frets are corroding, or sorry, what's the word? What's the word? And they go tarnishing or something. There's some black developing in the kind of join there between the fret crown and the fingerboard. Of course, he can't do anything to clean it, and he, said, he was asking me, did I think it was <coughs> even possible... Oh, bugger you. <laughs> did I think it was even possible to sort of cut in here with a blade <coughs> and uh, do something? And I just said, no, because you're just going to open this carpet up, and what you're going to end up with is you're going to end up with a... If you do that, you might be able to get into there, but you're going to get this sort of truncated fret carpet, uh, finished carpet, which stops there instead of going anywhere near the fret. And you've still got this weakness where it's going to flake 
from there onwards and so forth. So that's a, a really crap way. And it gets even worse, by the way, when you come to uh, refret. So if we go back in time badly, well, let's use this half of the thing. So let's say we're refretting over here. Na, 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 na. Right, so, and let's say our frets are just broken off there where we said in the beginning where the frets had been uh, shaved down. Obviously, we know it's a bit more like this sort of thing. If you can do it without making a mess, I can't. It's a bit more like that. <coughs> so when you come to pull the frets out, um, any of the material, you basically, you have to grasp them and pull them out. And, they, and uh, it's not very good drawing now, it's not accurate enough. But in pulling them out, you pull up the remaining finish which is stuck to the side. So I've drawn that extremely badly, but let's say it went like this. Here's your fret. Okay, and here comes your finish. And we know that it actually comes quite close to it. So it sticks very close to there, and then it goes sort of like this. Gets taken off the top of the fret there by polishing, and it comes down there like that and goes to there. Okay, so that's what you've got at the moment. And then some somebody comes and brings it to you and says, hey, can you refret this? And you go, yes. And so it's going to pull this fret up and out. Well, what's it going to do? It's going to break all of that off as well. And in doing so, you've got this sort of area where it's possibly going to chip or splinter the finish as it lifts it up because it's going to tear the carpet up with it. Right? So that's my little cautionary thing. That's why I hate the way they do it that way. Now, the reason they do it that way since I've done it the other way myself when making necks, and I can tell how much is involved, the reason they do it that way is because it's cheaper and it saves time, or it's quicker. Less, less person hours involved. And by person hours, we probably mean Mexican labor involved. Um, so that's why I don't like the USA-Mexican way of applying finish. They don't do that in China by the way. Um, if you, if you, I'll tell you the alternative, right, is to keep it simple, let's do the alternative. <coughs> the alternative is, you've got your fingerboard, and I'm using different wrong colors here, but uh, guess what? Oh, and there's, don't forget, we've got a slot, right? You've got your fingerboard and your slot, and what you do is you spray straight over there and you get this lovely finish on your fingerboard. And then at the end of all of that, you carefully cut out the slot again without tearing anything. You, I tend to do it as I go along with different coats. But you, <coughs> you keep the slot clear whatever way you best do it. Then when you've built up enough finish, which actually looks more like that, when you've got enough finish, you sand it back down until it's nice and flat. You've got yourself a beautiful flat finish which you buff and it becomes gloss. And then, incredibly, you basically press your fret onto there, like so. And as you can see, the fret sits on fresh finish, um, nice smooth gloss finish. And there's, there's none of this undulating, rippling stuff there, which you see in the, you can always tell is, a tr is the hallmark of the American system. When you see the light reflecting in the American and Mexican ones, you see this little crinkle before and after, like a little wave before and after each fret, which reflects the light in a particular sort of way. So you can always, you can always see that light bouncing off there and looking a little bit rippled. Um, so you don't get that with this method. Um, but the idea is that it takes longer because you have to clean out the slots. You can't just bang everything in and go. Also, you have to be much more careful because if you do the gloss bit first, every bit of fret work after that has to be so carefully done that it doesn't leave a mark uh, that doesn't scuff up your gloss fingerboard. So that's not easy. It takes care. I mean, you surely you can then mask it off and take care of it in some way or other, or just be a really precise and careful fretter. But um, and it is a challenge. I have to say, it's a challenge to fret and end bevel a guitar without uh, putting any scuffs on it. So not easy, but 
It's a much prettier way of doing it, and they've done it here. And they do it in the Chinese factory for the Squires. <coughs> the Squire uh, Classic Vibe series has, uh, I mean, okay, there's arguments, and I think the finish is too thick and too glassy, but the point is, it's a beautiful gloss finish, on top of which they press the frets, and there's none of this kind of blanket undulation thing. So, that little bit of chit chat aside, <coughs> you are joining me this evening for the fun and games of refretting this guitar. And I'm going to try and pretend I'm warm enough by taking off my scarf. <laughs> so I'm just going to take all the strings off for the time being. No, well, I'm not going to take them completely off. I'm going to take them off and we're going to take the... Uh, what are we going to do? We're going to take the um, neck off and then we're going to deal with the neck and we're going to take off the tuners and the string trees and so on and so forth. So this is getting a full refret and a full setup that goes with it, which is a new tusk nut on top of the original Corian one, which was pinging a little bit already, I heard on this one. Um, and we'll switch out the brass, uh, the saddles, corroded saddles. Not that they are no good or anything, but we'll just go for the brass because I was at the point of buying, ordering a whole set of grub screws um, and I just asked Larry if he would, instead of just buying the grub screws, would he like me to um, also uh, consider having the brass saddles as well, which he liked the idea of. So that's what we're going to do. So these strings are going to come in handy later on for the purpose of fret leveling, so I'm definitely going to want them to come back into play. If I can just get them tucked away safely, and for that purpose I'm going to <coughs> just lightly tag them down onto here, just sort of out of the way for the time being. Um, they're not in the likely in danger of scratching anything, so that's good. So I'm going to take the neck off at this point. Straightforward neck, shouldn't be anything surprises. I would not expect to find any shims. Um, the torque on that is very low. Okay. Now, I don't normally do this, but let's say, for example, you wanted to, you felt that it was important to keep a, a record of which screw went where, then you could do such as draw on here with a piece of, piece off, some marker. We go nut that way, bridge that way. Okay, and we got those four fellas in the right place. And then we could grab the thing. We could just hold those in place like so for the time being. It doesn't have to be tidy. And then we do the same again. And that gives us our original positions just in case anything was a certain way round. Unlikely to be. I don't usually do that but just thought I'd do that for fun. So now we're going to gently waggle our way out and we have an STB67, strap B67, I don't know, B blonde maybe, blonde ash, could be, something like that. STB67 EX2, a couple of other little marks on here for you, you close up hidden messages people. See that all looks good, all looks nice, let's have a look at the pocket, very, uh, very nice, a little bit of that's stain actually. So I was going to say a little bit of over spill here, but it's nothing that's going to upset the, uh, the levelness because it's uh, it's only stained, not the finish. So that tells us this is stained rather than a, a coloured lacquer. This is a stain followed by a clear a clear poly finish, I should say, not lacquer. But anyway, nice. Everything fits nice, and it's that little thing there is telling us, oh yes, it's a it's a neck adjusted truss rod. People have talked about ways of uh, let's just try and show this. I, I'm not convinced, but people go, people say, oh yes, see with that little thing down there, um, that little 
little gap. What they let you do, they say, is if you undo the things, the bolts, not completely, you can somehow do that and get access to it. Um, I don't know, I tried it and it puts so much strain on the bolts because they're not pulling straight up, they're trying to pull round in a, in a sort of rate, uh, curve. So I don't know, maybe, maybe you've done it in your time, but it's not something I like to do. I'd rather take it off completely. Um, now, the safe, safety's sake, I don't need to see this again for a while. So for the sake of safety, I'm going to put it in its case where it can be looked after by that ancient furry stuff. And then we leave ourselves with the thing on its own, the thing. Now, the, o the other thing, same applies here. Obviously, um, these have all got different... Um, Com we, could, we can keep them all in the same position too. These we're going to replace with tusk trees. Slightly different, obviously, from the original, and we keep the original ones. But we're going to replace it with tusk so that we have a continuous, uh, the least amount of friction possible. I've never been a fan of the butterfly tree. I know, all the famous greats have had them and hasn't been a problem, but don't like them myself. They're little. I hear them pinging sometimes, and it just annoys me slightly. So, at this point, I'm just um, removing those things that we call, oh, sorry, tuna screws. Come on. Had a fun fun day today. Um, so, very busy in the relove. So, I, my my days are. involve a lot of admin stuff, social media buying, and then I work in the evening, as you know, or well, many of you know, mostly. Um, although I do quite often do a spraying during the daytime, um, and sometimes I do a shift in the day and shift in the evening, but um, there's, there's plenty of stuff that I do at home, unpacking, packing, uh, receiving guitars, checking them, evaluating them, writing up a, a, a sort of an assessment notes so I know what I think is the issues and I can advise the owners what I think is needed and so on. Um, so lots to do and so I was home today and we ran out of, we had run out of cat food in the usual, oh dear it's time to go to the supermarket. So fine supermarket run, so I got me morning social medias and received, guitars received, sorted and out of the way and um, <coughs> we went off the supermarket and uh, arrived, pulled up at the supermarket, and um, <laughs> a guy parked next to us, next to us, next to us, said, "Oh, you've got flat tire." And he said, "Oh, he's got his right." And I looked at the back, <clears throat> and that flat tire turns out what I really need for this is um, I need a box for all these parts. Um, yeah, so a flat tire. It turned out that our roads around us here in Devon are pretty terrible condition. I mean, they are everywhere in the country. You know, we're, everybody's suffering from that right now. But they were in awful condition. And so we, uh, I'd hit this, well, I thought it was a pothole, but it, I drove past it the next time and I couldn't see it. It was not a pothole. But what happened was they had, the, the council, uh, there's a spot where ice builds up. So quite rightly, they they, whenever it gets really cold, they suddenly rush out and put a sign there with a, you know, a little triangular sign like you do in Britain. Anyway, and a caution ice thing. And they put it quite far into the road, or certainly did that day. It was the first day that it had been really icy. So I came along. Ooh. Mmm, telltales. Replacement tuners. Look at that. That's why these things may not appear to fit perfectly well. Um, yeah, so anyway, along I came, uh, driving along, and lo and behold, I hit this, um, well, I pulled out because of this uh, sign on the side of the road. I pulled out towards the middle of the road a little bit to avoid the sign. Um, and my wheel, or my, my wheels, or back wheels, as I came across, uh, ran over the center line slightly. And I, what I didn't know was that, um, 
been they've been reamed a little bit as well these holes so that's a replacement set of more modern these things tuners anyway um yes yeah, so i uh, i pulled out to avoid this sign and going pretty slowly but i hit what felt like a pothole and it was an absolute metal against metal solid bang and i thought god that's it because i did that on another crappy pothole on another bit of De devonshire's finest roads and completely des destroyed something popped a wheel a tire a year ago or two anyway so drove home and it appeared that it hadn't gone down or anything like that so left it for two days anyway we came out today and got to the supermarket and the a nice bloke said oh yeah um, you've got a flat tire so i went and had a look and sure enough it was pretty flat and it, but it hadn't gone down in one go but it was evidently straight away i could tell that it was from the the past couple of days when we hit that thing so we went looking for the pothole and um, I had to park up somewhere safe it's a very quick bit of road and not very safe for walking on and certainly not very safe for walking on when there's ice about anyway so i took my courage in my hands and went to have a, a sort of look and um can you see oh yes and uh, I found it, and uh, to my amazement, it was rather than a pothole as such. It it was well, it was a pothole, but it had built up. It had built up before the. Um, it was like in the middle of the road, and it it was like a trench that led up to the uh, cat's eye, and so it had kind of dug a trench below the cat's eye, and as a result. Um, when you, when one hits it, like I did, uh, it hit the cat's eye housing, which is quite smooth because it's meant to be. It's meant to allow you to kind of drive over it. Um, but it it also, um, because it had worn away even further down, uh, there was a much deeper bit that I ran into as well. So it was a double hit. So anyway, I stopped and took the... Curved, by the way. Um, took a great risk of photographing it and uh, after after I'd got a brand new blasted tyre for 115 quid. So I'm going to be, as much as I don't really want to do it, and for once I am going to go after the council for a uh, compensation or, or a refund on that. So I've taken the pictures and I shall be applying later on. But it was, it was so lucky, and the funny part is, is it was that was that was me out of money. You know, it was the last spare hundred quid I had this month, leading up to rent, accountant bill, MOT bill, all those things that come in in January in our house. But anyway, um, so uh, I'll go in there. Yeah, so I thought, how lucky, being a glass half full kind of person. I thought, how. How lucky that it didn't go down in one go and leave us stuck at home because that really would have been an absolute pain in the backside. How lucky that it um, it went down slowly and that the guy in the supermarket car park spotted it with just enough to drive to the garage and get them to do it. And how kind of the garage to fit me in right there and then, although they're very busy and I could get it done straight away, no matter that it cost 115 quid. And with a bit of luck, I'm hoping to get that back. So I thought it was a, a very lucky thing. And even, I know that, I guess some people would be saying, oh, I've got no money left at all. Well, I've got lots of good guitar jobs coming in. Um, and actually compared to three quarters of the entire world, we're doing incredibly well just to have, you know, food in the in the cupboards and, you know, car to drive and stuff. So I'm, I'm completely grateful count my blessings let's say and it was just really great that there was exactly enough spare money to pay for the tire over this next couple of days and get back home with the shopping uninterrupted and without without actually even taking any more time and then to go back and find the yonder pothole and be ready to photograph it and hopefully get a refund on it so here we go we are going to pull out the frets on this 
old neck. Now, this isn't one of those ancient guitars that had the necks, uh, necks had the frets put in sideways by Fender's mysterious sideways fretting machine. That's the first thing. It is not one of those. But, frankly, even if it were, um, when you, if you have, if you come across one of those old necks, sort of 1960s or something, then by all means, um, tap them out sideways if you know it's one of those necks, but don't, don't even bother to try and fit them sideways because you're not going to be able to do it. You don't have Leo Fender's or whatever his name, I've forgotten his name, Rand, Dan, Don Randall's, Don, Don Randall's special funny machine. Um, nobody does, I don't think. Well, maybe a couple of enthusiasts do. So even if you tap them out sideways, so that the theory being that there's a ridge that if you pull up, it'll more likely tear because it was designed to be driven in sideways with the top of the wood kind of touching tightly against the fret tang. Um, so you probably don't want to pull them out vertically, but once you've tapped them out, you might as well, um, you won't you're going to put them in vertically anyway so you're going to change that bit of history <laughs> anyway so yeah so despite being today this second penniless i feel very lucky and that i'm here doing work that i enjoy and i've got plenty of it stacked up for the next week to 10 days and there's more coming so um i just think why would i worry the universe is very something uh, that is a funny thing there. It looks like a, a kind of ding, but it actually doesn't feel to be. Um, anyway, so the real reason we're refretting these is because they're low. Um, too low. But what we've got as well, we've got this strange inset. I don't know how well you can see this, but if you go right to the edge, you see how they've been deliberately, well, I say deliberately, but how can they have been beveled like that? It's as if, how about this for a conspiracy theory. It's as if hmm, the wood was drier in Japan than it is now. They fretted it, used the end bevel machine to end bevel these frets, and the wood has expanded over the years. Can you believe that? Uh, that's that is the only way I can think this can have happened. If you just look at that, that's been covered before. No, first of all, it's not been refretted. If you were a luthier, if you were a luthier, there is not a chance on this planet that you would try to um, fret a millimeter, three quarters of a millimeter back from the edge. And you can see that the way it looks like it's been pressed in there, it looks like this once covered that. Now, we know for a fact, first, first of all, the reason why I'm saying nobody's cut the frets and then put them in like that is because... Um, unless they were cut by computer and you had a whole set cut ready to the precise length and you just spaced them out with the same amount of gap at each end which it's got here but unless you, you even if you did that by hand you, you would get it wrong there would be a little bit of wiggle and this is perfect so the only way you could have got these frets perfect is if you they originally came right to the edge and then you end beveled them like we do for the angle and this has expanded the wood has expanded over the years. That's amazing. I mean, that's my hypothesis based on sort of clunky common sense logic, unless you know some other remarkable way. But that that's the only way I know that you would get a fret on there. That's the very edge you can see. Right? That's the very edge of the fingerboard. And you can see this six then is inset and it's come inwards because if it hadn't been that would still be clear do you see what I mean so this is sat on top of there that's amazing it's amazing now I'm looking at this and I'm saying looking at the way this edge is has it been has it been sprayed first have I wasted all of my hot air no I think that's still I think that's still that looks like a, an expanding thing that's pushed its way outwards over the years. That's so odd. <clears throat> anyway, so what we've got is we've got the task of removing these frets. 
and we're going to do it in as kindly a way as possible and um, it's not one of those uh, ancient American sideways fretted things which funnily enough the very first refret I ever did was a vintage uh, music master which had exactly those kinds of frets which was really a good, quite a nice tough learning curve but they you know I, I figured out that okay maybe they did it seemed a bit hard to even believe that they actually pushed them in sideways it seemed like a really ridiculously silly thing to do but I could if you had a machine that genuinely did it yeah I could sort of uh, I could almost imagine you'd do it that way but anyway um, but there was <coughs> it pretty became pretty obvious that there was no way you were going to push frets into there um, to refret it. So it was always going to have to be straight down. So to refret, we're going to do a couple of things, three things really, to try and ease the frets journey out of the finish. First thing we do is we're going to put as much curvature as we can, a uh, back bow, I should say, into the neck. So sorry, you can't see this for a minute. Let's do this so you can. Right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try and back bow it so that um, the... Oh, blimey. <laughs> Let's go the other way first then. Uh, so what we want is it to be as arched as possible so that um, we release kind of some of the pressure of the wood against the tang, the fret tangs. Now, as it's showing me at the moment, this really doesn't want to go back bowed so I have no choice I've, I've only got what I've got to work with um, so that's a little flag straight away you're working with a neck that has no appreciable back bow uh, truss rod it's tight rammed up tight so there's no bend if if we have strings on here if we had strings on here that pull it into too great a relief too big of a curve too big a curve I'm starting to sound American um, if you had that, then um, that would be it. You couldn't dial it out with this truss rod, I'm afraid. So the first thing we do is try and get as much back bow in. Second thing we do is take a wet cloth and we're just going to put it on here. Now, this this is not to try and soften up the finish because the finish is poly and it's cured uh, and it's solid. This is only to hopefully get a bit of steam into the... <coughs> excuse me. A little bit of steam into the... Uh, thing the slots now I've just noticed that I've got uh, a different um, soldering iron really tip than the one I actually want on there so while I'm just doing this I'm going to carefully undo this one get myself turn this off get myself the pliers and remove this one and heat it up again with a different one on um, the reason for that is this one's a bit big and I just want a smaller tip but this one the bigger one is good for fitting pots and wiring pots inside electric cavities. So off comes the sheet, the barrel thing, off comes the tip which is very hot and magnetic so leave it there. On goes the old one, over it goes the sheath thing and then on top of that goes the Dewey up thing which holds it all together. And then we'll do it up a bit with so right. So I just need then to heat this up again. So the plan tonight, I'm on a bit of a time constraint again because my missus has gone to visit her friend in town and so I have to be as far along as I can with this refret. So I think tonight getting the frets out, um, checking and cleaning up the fret edges. Um, because it's a, a, ma a maple, a gloss maple finish, I'm not going to obviously re radius it with any sandpaper. So I'm going to work only on the, the kind of area that the frets sit themselves. So I'll use a little special homemade tool for that. And then I'm going to cut through the slots again with... <coughs> I think realistically I could try and leave the end bits in or I could cut them through to make sure if you leave the end bits in it's a sort of a little it's kind of a bit prettier uh, 
you can sort of it looks a little bit nicer and saves you filling those end gaps but if you um alternatively if you if you do that um you don't get a very good uh clear out of the fret slot so if you want to be certain of your uh nothing being in the fret slot the best way to be sure about that is to be able to run a saw through there I mean there are various little tools but if you if you think about not breaking these end bits then your your slot <coughs> your slot cleaning can only ever start here and stop there which is actually a lot harder to do than it sounds um, and so you, you may end up accidentally uh, breaking out one of the little the delicate little polyurethane finish fills so there a lot when you add it all up the pros and cons it does probably add up to being more sensible uh, to um, to um, lose those end fills uh, sorry, I don't know where you are now terrible terrible viewing yeah it makes sense to lose the end fills uh, for the sake of being able to clear out the um, let's just make sure this one's yeah to be able to clear out the fret slots because actually the key to a successful refret is preparing your <coughs> fret slots and your the surface that your frets new frets are going to go on to which includes the surface of the neck and the condition of the slots so preparing that to the best way best condition you can and then preparing your frets the best way you can and those two things will give you the best chance of um, a good refret. The, the, the business of um, leveling after that is a kind of smaller detail really. Um, once you get those in, you're just doing, I'd be just, the leveling experience would be pretty much as if I, I'd taken in a customer's guitar that had come from the factory. Um, because my fretting will be as accurate or as even no more no less than a, a typical factory fretting because in a sense there's not a lot of difference between them in how they're done so um you know my my fret work will be as good as somebody else is tapping it in in a factory so now i've lifted all these edges now i'm going to sort of come back across the frets and <coughs> kind of walk my way along the fret with some heat, some added heat, and the idea being is to try and get the frets to come up. Now this one, just as a start, this one's kind of, um, it's not wanting to come up so easily, so I'm conscious in case it's in any way stuck. Um, I know that the tuners have been replaced, but I don't expect this will have been re refretted. So. But at this point, when you're doing it, you don't know whether you're dealing with, you know, um, somebody else's uh, fretting work or whether you're, you're, you're dealing with a factory. Now, looking down here, I'll show you afterwards, but looking at this, I've got a feeling that this was oversprayed. And I've all of my stuff about the, the inevitability of those blankets and ripples of um, finish are slightly meaningless well and it may actually just be a matter of degrees but i don't think it is because there's nothing that runs up the side of these frets so i think i think do what do i what do i think there isn't any material up the side of these frets so that has to be done as a flat surface but it just it, lifting it up i think what i'm seeing is that lifting it up leaves the finish still there and actually the what's What's fooling me is it's lighter, so I'm thinking it's clearer finish. But actually, what it is, it's lighter because it hasn't discolored over the years. Um, so I haven't told you a load of nonsense at the beginning. I would be, I'd be a bit hard on myself if that was the case. Now this one doesn't want to come up, so I'm going to give it a little pull, a little rotate at one end. So I'm using these Hosco. Um, fret puller very oh, pretty sharp 
colours. Actually, they're Hosco. Well, they, they were labelled Hosco, but they're branded something else. Something. I can't actually. Something E A K S K S. Anyway, they were listed. They were advertised as Hosco, so they may just be branded differently. But they are fab because they are really fine, thin, grippy, pulley things. Um, so they're making this job. So by this time, you've usually got a sense, a feeling, an instinctive feeling about how this job's going to go because you're not, I'm not struggling with any of the frets at this moment. Um, whether it's rosewood or maple, if you're, sometimes you'll know you're having trouble already because the frets are pulling out, as they come up they're pulling sort of splinters of either finish or in the rosewood case little slivers of rosewood are coming up, tear outs <coughs> are coming up with them and this is all fine. So that feels good. Um, I know it's a 7.25 inch radius. I checked it, it looks pretty accurate. I'm going to make sure that I bend my fret wire a fraction over that um, so that I get uh, a little grip, a little tighter grip. What, what I'm seeing left behind underneath these frets is from the water, it's just a little bit of mud created by the dust and goo that's built up there over time. And um, so, but nothing, nothing tearing or pulling out. And of course, because the, they're tapped in from above, as you pull them out, you get left the sort of impression of where the fret tangs went in. But it's uh, it's nothing to worry about. So the, the thing about deciding about do I cut the end gaps out, um, it's, it's a funny one because it's actually quite difficult to fill these end gaps with something that doesn't end up requiring you do a fair bit of remedial work on the finish. Um, but since at this point in time I don't really know whether we're going to need to do any remedial work. Sometimes just end beveling the frets ends up with you needing to do some finish repair, depending on various little factors about, um, I don't know exactly, how, whether you touch the edge of the fingerboard normally to, um, to get the metal of the fret flush with the fingerboard, you have to your file has to contact the fingerboard, which means it does, by definition, take a small amount of finish away. Um, if that, if a lot comes away, you may have to retouch it with a polyurethane finish. In this case, um, uh, I'm pretty certain it's not. Uh, just l judging by it, I, I didn't, don't remember from my research if it said that it said it was a nitrocellulose finish. It's unlikely. Um, but anyway, so um, we can always test that if we needed to. Um, but as you can, it, e either way, it's it's touchable, upable on the edge, if necessary. And that one put up a bit more of a fight, um, and it lifted a little bit of the finish from its track with it. Um, but that's only what it was stuck onto, if you get my meaning. It was touched down on there, and maybe the factory did or didn't use some glue in there. It doesn't feel like they did. Um, the benefit of having an automated, or not automated, but a precision manufacturing system is you obviously reach a point where you you can preset the width of your fret tang slot, or fret slot, um, and therefore you can be confident that this uniformly mani manufactured piece of fret wire will every time um, go into the wood without needing glue and it's obviously when we do refrets as techs or luthiers we're far less likely to be able to depend on that because we're getting old guitars that have been sometimes have been refretted again in the past and so we we're dealing with worn out slots and whatnot <laughs> um, all of which means we may need to revert to either glue which we I think we'd all love it if we didn't have to ever use any glue 
um, or sometimes we have to even revert to uh, nipping little burrs onto the frets to give them a little bit more of a sideways grip than the, the tangs are currently giving it. Um, and that happens occasionally when the slots are too ragged. <coughs> I don't think I've mentioned before, but there is a, a repair gauge of fret called, not surprisingly, repair fret wire. And I never knew what the hell that was for. And so I did that thing of finally looking out to see what on earth they were talking about. And it turns out that what they mean by repair fret wire is simply regular, regular gauge of wire, but with a slightly thicker tang, so that you're kind of making up for the looseness of the slot from having been used or done before. So that's was good to learn. I thought it was some sort of different material or or some people often tell imagine that you can repair a dinged fret with uh, solder. So I was kind of I thought maybe this this repair wire in inverted commas might be some sort of special specialist hard solder that you could fill a ding with like what you would want to do that for. Anyway, so it turns out my initial skepticism about that was well-founded, because it isn't. It's just a fatter tang, baby. So, as we come towards the end of the pull, I'm coming up on the last one, and we're going to lever it out gently. <coughs> Turn off the, that thing that's known as, in good circles, decent circles, is known as the soldering iron is off. And there we have a load of fret wire. Now we always tend to throw it away early, so I'm going to keep it one side because it is useful to know, to be able to measure the um, thickness of the tang. Now what I'm going to do at this point now is I'm going to get a straight edge. In this case I'm going to use this ruler. A straight edge is a straight edge. I don't need any of that thing with notches and slots on it and all I'm looking for at the moment is what's this doing generally um, it's very difficult to tell uh, I think that's, a <coughs> that's almost dead straight as it is yeah so I'm not going to worry about anything else there's no I don't want to dial in any relief into it it's straight by default but we know that that's as as um, straight as it's going to go or it's not going to adjust any further. Now, so now we have the question about the fret ends. So you may be able to see here that the fret ends now have their original bit of slightly grimy fill, which is, who knows, it's a combination of probably just the polyurethane finish. Um, now, if we wanted to, we could preserve that um, and work inside of it. Okay, now I don't really want to do that because um, partly uh, it's a lot of hard work and you don't know if you've cleaned the slots out properly. And if you don't know you've cleaned the slots out properly, then to be honest, you, you are always jeopardizing your next pressing or frets. Um, so one way to help make that decision would be if the fret tang of our new wire is thicker anyway slightly or a lot but it's pretty ma it's a pretty close match in terms of uh, gauge but if it's a little bit thicker then we're going to need to manually widen the slots very slightly and um, that will be require that we get saws in there <coughs> and so preserving the end fills is going to be impossible so actually I've got enough for two guitars and something instinctively told me to buy enough for two guitars and then uh, as soon as I did that um, Nick agreed that he wanted me to refret his Made in Mexico three bolted neck one. So I'm getting 0.50 uh, tang width here and um, here I'm getting wow. So has this been refretted? 
this isn't this is this is a bit chunkier so what did we have here we had we had two yeah we had two so the tang tang is a little bit lighter on this one and we had two so it's the right wire but it feels a little bit <laughs> interesting so technically we could preserve the end fills um, worst comes to the worst if, if it doesn't work then we can always uh, we can always go back and pull them out now the, the question you're looking for here is is there detritus in here so I think, yeah, you can just about see so my first thing is to kind of go along here and actually it's very uh, <coughs> it's very clean it's, it's the cleanest I've come across for a long time there's absolutely no gunge at all so they weren't glued the first time that's for sure um, but it's see now that what happens is you end up probably end up cutting through on one end there's a bit of and that's just water so you can get all the way to the end I have done it before where I've preserved the end fill and it, it's quite sort of neat in a way it's just like preserving a, an antique look these um, fret slots do feel quite big, so I'm going to cut me a, well, in a minute we'll cut some frets, um, but these feel like they're going to possibly fall right in, so we may have to do some fret end, they're very clean. We may have to do some fret end uh, thingy anyway. So, but we still have a slight unevenness where the, um, where the, fret ends have sat and stuff has built up so we still do need to use one of my little custom made pieces of fret wire which has been um, basically detanged and bent in such a way that I can um, just very carefully take away any ridges now we have to concentrate a little right on the edge here where those frets pulled back because actually they've built up a little bit of grunge there and you can see that once I've done that one it's a much smoother surface than the other ones, or I could tell you from feel. Um, I'm still not 100% sure this wasn't over sprayed, and I'm trying to figure out what the major difference will have been if it was over sprayed, because it's, it doesn't have any of the carpeting uh, sort of feel that the American ones have. And I mean, it could just be skill in application. I mean, I have over sprayed, and to be fair, Mine hasn't ended up looking like those American, Mexican ones. So maybe it is an attention to detail thing that makes all the difference. Um, of course, the other thing, by the way, if I do this as a, um, if I pursue it as a, let's keep the, the little bit of poly at the end, um, then we're, ta we're cutting an overhang uh, and treating the, basically treating the fret job as if it was a, um, uh, a, a bound neck so it's <coughs> it's a lot of not precision I mean it's always precision but it oh it's what was making that hmm. I've gone mad um, yeah it's 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 a it's a lot of extra work just to preserve the fret ends and actually they're not well they are there my worry would be that I go to all this work and try it and then we're going to lose the fret ends anyway during the end beveling process so um, there's no point going to that length if it doesn't really achieve anything and the, and the reason I'm slightly nervous is because fret end filling is something I really haven't got down to my own satisfaction um, I've tried all manner of substances um, and they just don't seem to work the way I want them to um, in this case we've got we've got a blonde finish so what we'd want to do is uh, a sort of a vintage poly uh, you know tinted poly sort of fill the problem with that is if you do it with a uh, sort of you get a liquid poly you know like a, a jar um, I've got I've got some of that at home water-based gloss poly but 
it's very um, liquid, so it doesn't. It hasn't got the sort of uh, thickness to sit on the end and block it up and then dry quickly. It hasn't got the decency to dry quickly, so you could be there forever. And if it decides to soak it in, which it often does, if the fret slot decides it's going to absorb it, then you really are. That's what's making the noise. Then you really are stuck. Um, adding more and then it absorbs that too and then you're going to add some more yeah these little bits are falling out I think I think I'd be nuts to try and retain these little end fills I think I'm going to treat it like uh, like a see the interesting bit is that they've they've cut it they've cut it to uh, sorry about my fingers they're in the cold wet and work beaten um, but yeah they've 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 end beveled it. There's no doubt about that. It's not uh, undercut, um, and they've what they've done is they've just touched over the end of the fret with a bit of finish. And, and because it's been beveled right to the edge, none of it's been absorbed in, so it hasn't had that sort of trying to fill a gap. So I guess the secret of this is just going to be, um, or the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to remove the end fill, and I'm going to cut through just to make sure either with a blade or the saw or just even with a snap off blade there just to make absolutely sure that it's a clean um, slot and then we will go through the process of figuring out how to just touch up the end uh, and if we if we get it flush to the end which that one should have been because it, well it was until it shrank back I think um, then we should be all right. A lot of finishes, a lot of guitars, especially um, rosewood ones, rosewood boards, old guitars, the frets will just come to the end and f sit against your fingers. You won't have any finish going over them or anything like that. Um, now, of course, if if it's true that this was done as a spray over the whole fingerboard but lightly done and with more skill than the Americans have been doing or the Mexicans then um, it, it would it would explain easier why there is a uh, a fret that's end beveled with a block at an angle and also has just a smooth finish that goes over it at the same thickness of, as all the rest of the finish and the reason that would be of course is because uh, it's the whole thing is just an over spray so they may have just done the whole neck over in con contrary to what I suggested at the beginning but that's just you know all I'm surmising is from experience of now actually if I think back and the occasions I've had to do a re for a refinish and funnily enough it tended to be uh, once or twice in the past where a Mexican um, Strat fender uh, where its um, finish has flaked off and that is another problem with a certain batch not many thankfully but a certain batch of fenders from Mexico and from America seem to lose their finish or never had correct finish adhesion and as a result you can be you find them the finish starts to fall off much earlier than you'd expect and also can come off as soon as you start doing a refret or you put a masking tape on there and it just comes away in sheets so uh, I'm not expecting that to happen on this because it's Japan but um, and they have not seen that problem from the Japanese factory yet um, but certainly have a few times and it's quite well known I think amongst Fender aficionados that there was some sort of issue with the finish sticking or not sticking anyway um, so, um, yeah, and I, the reason I was telling you that is because when I recall uh, having poly finished, refinished, using poly, refinished uh, a particular, or an, either guitar, the two or three guitars, any of the two or three guitars where the finish has flaked off like that, um, I recall that obviously because of time uh, I I absolutely sprayed over myself um, which I don't do if I'm making it from scratch but 
I did on those because it was way, you know, we'd run way over the customer's time. They didn't expect the original finish to fall off. It did, and so it was a kind of catch up and get everything put right um, type of deal. And of course, I, I wasn't charging them any extra money because it wasn't really their fault. And it wasn't my fault either, but it wasn't really their fault. So, um, but as it happens, because it was a light overspray, and I used nitro as well in one case, because it was a light finish, very light finish, it didn't have that carpet gloopy, crinkly, shininess thing that I talked about. So it may just be, I may be wrong that this is a particular difference in technique. Um, it may just be a difference in attention to detail of how thick the finish is applied. But I would still expect to see some on the sides of these frets, and I don't, which I have to say makes me think uh, there is something in my reckoning. Anyway, I can't know, I can't go back in time, and I can't go back to the factory where this was made, or, or the others were made to nail it. Maybe there's some sort of story in, in some fender owners, you know, that sort of detailed website discussion forum. I'm sure somebody who worked there would, would have that information or shared it already. We did this, then we did that. That's how we did it in the 60s at Fender or whatever, no doubt. But I haven't seen it. So for the time being, I guess I'll work on my has some or my hypothesis that's what's happening um, and then and also I will continue to do it the other way round um, get it all level first and then press the frets on top and and just go make take extra care to um, ensure that in the fretting process that lovely gloss finish is not damaged I've done a couple of custom builds that way and they look pretty good when they went to the customer. I won't say perfect because it, it is very difficult to work on something for any length of time and effort without it leaving some handling trace. Now, I know they do it in the factories, but they're used to it and they wear gloves and stuff. Why don't you get some gloves, Sam? Well, that's true. I could do too. Right. Just about coming towards the final end of the final one. So what I'm doing here is, I'm, as much as anything, I'm trying to make sure that the edges where the new frets are going to touch down are going to be nice and clear. So one thing I would like to do first is, let's just move this to one side. I'm going to undo the fret wire. And the first thing I think I'd better do is to divide this into two, and actually into four, which is what I normally divide it into two. But if I divide it into four, then I can borrow a s small piece of wire as a test. See what's happening with the fret slots. <sighs> I'm go on the floor for the time being. I'll hoover it another time. So this wire is sold in um, meter coils. So I've got two meters here. So if I figure out where my ends are, where my Enzo's are. I've got one end here, one end here. So if I would cut it, oh hell, let's figure out. That goes around to there. Where would my midpoint be? That's hard to figure out. Huh? Uh, it's not the end of the world if I don't get it. I've got two wire, two points here. One is, I don't want to cut in both places, do I? Where's my midpoint? Is it down the bottom there? I think it must be. Logic would tell me it's here. I'm going to just take a bite of it with that logic. If I'm wrong, I shall pay for it. Oh my god. Oh! Ha! I completely cut the wrong thing off altogether. Well, how stupid. I missed, I grabbed the wrong thing. That's what I wanted. What a fool. Sorry. Duh. Anyway, so I was going to go like that, and then I was going to cut it in half again each time. 
how silly, how silly, how silly. I've now created myself a spare bit I didn't need to do. Ugh. Well, I'll start with that spare bit. Anyway, it's better to do that. I don't want to work with huge coils. But what I was going to do was start with a piece here. And I was going to cut it, and I just wanted to feel how it sits in. And actually, I can feel almost straight away that it's, um, it's sitting in there very easily. So we may have to do some widening stuff. So I'm just going to cut an underhang. So I, for the minute, I'm going to try and cut an underhang. You're going to behave. Thank you. Um, so I can just have a sort of, oh, I hate when this does that. What's wrong with you? I'm not sure this is used to cutting small gauge wire. Thank you. That's crap, but anyway, I can use it for a small piece. But the idea here would be... Sorry, you can't see nothing. And the idea is I'm trying to just get a, an inset piece of wire and just see how it fits. It's not radius or anything, um, but I'm trying to see how, the, how well the slots fit in and whether it's going to need... Um, actually, no, you're, that's going to go all right. It's a bit... it's not the tightest. But I'm going to use, I'm going to be using, what's the word of that glue? <sighs> Tote bond. Right, so I'm going to get, first of all I'm going to get rid of the um, old frets, because now we don't need them. And then I'm going to radius this new wire, and I want to radius it to less than 7.25. So that's a manual task, for which you can probably see me on the, Overhead camera, cut to the overhead camera. So for this job I need my thing, my radius guide, and I need my wire. Um, let's have a look at what we've got. How does this feel? How does it feel? That's just randomly to whatever it was set for for the previous thing. That's a little bit off, not yet ready. So undo this, um, tighten it up a little bit. It's it's very unscientific. Uh, I think that is going to be too much. As you can probably tell. 7.25. Yeah, that's too much. So straighten that out again. Undo this and go the other way. Uh, Right is back, left is in. Right is out, left is in. So there's a tight little radius. Looks like a Fibonacci spiral, which we don't want. That is a nice little tight bit over 7.25. So let's just get this one stretched back out as much as we can, and then we'll try again. Try it. Let's try it. Is it consistent? I'm going to consistently. That's fairly consistent. 7.25. That's a little bit tighter than 7.25. So I'm going to do it a second time round. It should be the same, but you never know. It may just tweak it an extra little bit, but that will be good. So. I think that is a good, so tight circle, 7.25. That's tighter than, the, but that will do me. So I'm going to do the same with the spare piece and the other long piece. Now I'm just going to put all of them through twice just to try and make sure they're the same. So it is these benders, ha 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 ha. Titter, titter. These benders are crude, crude benders, um, but they're effective. And frankly, as long as you get a bit more than 7.25, you'll, you'll work. So that one doesn't quite tighten up the same as the other one. That's interesting. That's a little bit wider. How does that work? Well, 
What did I say? Right is out, left is in. That doesn't even seem to move at all, but let's see if it tightens this up any. Oh, what's going on here? Yeah, it does. That's just ridiculous. That hardly moved anything. Right. Right is out. <coughs> I think that will be about right. <laughs> That's very odd. That's about right. A little bit tighter on one end here, but why why that is so I don't know. But that's that's let's go with that. Okay, so we had our first one cut, which wasn't radius, but let's cut a few more. So the idea would be let's cut one now that could be the same. What are we thinking? Are we gonna try and no we're not gonna try and keep that's silly. Let's get a saw and let's cut the slots in such a way that we get a clean cut through and then we will just look at going over the edge. So I'm going to cut in a little bit, cut in and then back, in, back. As I suspected, very clear, nothing caught in the slots which is good. And then the next thing, now we've got the radius, I want to just lay a fret in there and see if it, how much grip, extra grip it's going to need. And we can, there's no, even no harm, we could tap one in the first, or spare, we're going to get enough spares out of these four, four meters of wire. And we'll tap one in and see how it sits. So that's clear. Let's use a bit of this curly radius wire. Let's cut it off here. And let's pop it on there. And let's do, I'll get a little block of wood. Uh, I will get a little block of wood. Oh, here's a little block. I'll probably do. And I'll just get a different hammer. And I'll just need to tap this down on here. Have a look. That's not too bad, but there is a bit of what's going on here. Is that a bit of spring at the end? We shall see. So I think we should be, as always, prepared to um, glue with a bit of the old um, tight bond. So what I'm going to do at this point in time, I'm going to cut all the bits of wire that we're going to need. Um, a little bit difficult now because it's, it's, it's bending. So I'm going to have to hold it up. Can't see now, sorry. I'm holding it up off the table to cut the wires. So one. So I'm, I'm over cutting, but I'm trying not to waste too much. Two and so on. With a tight radius, it, sometimes it's better to move the wire or the whole thing off the table like this because it's very difficult to put the coil in such a way that you can uh, fix it while it's down because it's, it's getting caught. As you can see, eventually I'm going to run out of... And I can't hold it now with my other hand. <laughs> like so. We could just draw a load of marks on it, but now I can just about put it on the deck here. Mm -hmm. Now sometimes this um, this cutter can, I don't quite know how, but it can put little tiny ding marks on the frets. It's okay because they will get taken out in the fret polishing uh, fret leveling and polishing part, but occasionally something about the biting of it does that, and it's it's quite annoying. Now, 
partly as I'm going along here and when we get to sit down over on the bench to do the pressing, um, I'm going to have to assess quite quickly whether this needs the tangs nibbling a little bit and I'll, I'll do that quite crudely with a pair of pliers. You can buy special tools for that, I've never had one. Um, seems a lot of money to buy and I've done the same sort of job when I've needed to with uh, just biting a little, tearing a little edge of the tang with a, f a set of a certain kind of pliers, cutters. Anyway, it does seem to work. Um, that was a funny, is that a funny shape? We shall see when we get down to it. So what I could do while I'm at it, no, I'm not going to do it because I don't know what the radius is. I'm fairly certain it's a nine and a half, but I'm not sure. So I'm not going to run ahead until I know for sure. So uh, we've got two, with two meters of wire, you get quite a bit of leftover wire. So we can afford some of these to not fit perfectly, or if the, if the bend is a little bit wonky at places, we could probably go back uh, and pick a new piece of wire from the amount we've got left over. So again here we've got this this thing that's it's, it's in the way, so I'm going to again hold off here. Now, I've got a thing that I don't like the first centimetre and a half of this wire, so that's coming off. There's a straight bit on the first part of the wire often. So I'm going to try and cut that without making a little ding on the next bit. I don't usually work with small gauge frets like this. I tend to be a much more of a jumbo fretter. Um, and I, I guess part of my nervousness, these aren't low by any means, but the lower they get, I, I feel like I'm losing my margin for fret leveling and that's just a, a sort of an over hesitance about you know getting it right in the fretting process which I shouldn't worry about because it usually works out absolutely fine um, but it's a, just a natural over cautiousness to not get caught out uh, so these are coming out everywhere as I handle the things I mean they're not they're not gripping very well it's okay, I haven't really tapped them in yet. Okay, so this is my first one, first set, and I've got quite a chunk left over for mistakes. Obviously not a whole set, I've got I've got the remainder for the other neck, um, but this two meters gives you a fret's worth with plenty of room for error. Now, my f feeling about this is that they're not going to be hugely easy to, um, they're not massively tight gripping. And I, I'm going to find out, now let's have a look, here's my nippers that I would use before. I think they may be a bit worn out for that purpose. So, I may have to, I may have to consult these and see whether it's doable with these. These have already started to chip as well. I'm frightened that's going to cause. Uh, it'd be better if I could use the side cutters. Let's see. So, the, I don't know if you can see here, but if I was doing a little bit of tang widening, it would be sort of like this a little cut and a twist. And it just adds a bit of extra gripness. It may even be too much. It's hard to tell. So it's a bit a bit trial and error. But you get you sort of tend to get the get the um hang of it and you get the feel of how much you need. So those little nibbles will add a bit of grippery. So I've pushed that down now, that's quite that's quite yeah, that's quite firm. So it gives me a sense of what I might do before I sit down to do it. Now let me consult the time. We've got to leave here at nine. 
the time is coming up to eight. So I think we're in a good place to start getting the whoops, getting the pressing done, um, which leaves <laughs> leaves the other one over there, the other camera showing nothing of any interest. Have I got a place? I no, I haven't really got a place. Well, I don't know. Let's see. It's not going to hurt, is it? So what I'm going to do for once, huh? I never do this. I'm still running. I'm going to take off this. Uh, I'm going to turn this light on. Do I turn that light on? Hello, are you alive? Oh dear. Uh, no, it's here. Let's put you on. Donk. Ooh. Sorry about this camera. That looks terrible. That probably looks terrible. Shall I just put... Yeah, go on. You go there. I don't know what you can see. I can see what you can see. How's your battery? I don't know. You're going to tell me in a minute, aren't you? Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to... Oh, I think three of these have fallen off already. I'm going to put these three down there. And then I'll take all of them off and put them in a line. I'm going to go and get my pliers. I'm going to make sure I've got my neck cool right. So you can tap all these in. But since we've got a removable neck, a bolt-on neck, and since we've got we've got a removable neck, and what else have we got? We've got a press. What am I looking for? I'm looking for... Come on, Samuel. I'm looking for glue. I'm looking for something to put the glue in. Glue in. There's a, there's a pot. There's some glue can go in there. I need a knife. Oh, and there was something else up here that I needed. Oh yes, the pliers for doing that bit of biting. Then we need to need to clamp down the press so it stays still, and we'll be ready to go. And the mirror. That's what I needed from over here. The mirror. The mirror. Right. So we'll just keep that. Nicely locked in place. Let's get a bit of foam and we'll get the call for clamping down on things, won't we? <sighs> Where's it gone? Oh dear. It's done a runner. I need to replace it as well. But it's somewhere under, probably somewhere under here. There it is. Thank God it was findable. That will help. So, my mirror to see what I can see. There it is, not particularly fancy looking. That is looking down, but what the heck. Um, here's our thing, here's our thing. What shall we begin with? Shall we begin with this? Now, I've got a worry, and I can't seem to, I can't seem to assuage my worry about this thing. I've got to replace it because it's wearing out. And it's it's running out of its sponginess here and the way it works is you need the gap here is too big I probably need something on here I wonder if I should put a vice is that going to help? no, I need a piece of metal to go across there that I can maybe if it, even if metal won't work maybe I should do this and that stops it falling in the hole I haven't done that before I won't bother with that. So I don't have to go so far out to the edge. Okay. So I haven't got glue in there, so let's get some glue in there. <coughs> this is the getting very old. Ew. But there is some in there. That's more than enough. Oh God. So I've got a, a wet cloth for wiping up, cleaning up. I've got... Uh, I've got me... Grippery, I mean, a thing for adding some tang nibbles. So I think maybe let's see for the first one. Let's try. Oh, I need to make sure I've got my correct thing in as well. Hold on. I need the 7.25, and that means I need. Uh, where's it gone? Where has the. Brilliant. I seem to have lost the. 
hex key required to undo that. Oh, let's play a guessing game now. Which one is it? That one? Maybe. That one? Maybe. Uh, probably an unusual one. It's kind of critical, really, because if you don't find the right one, we'll never get it done. Too big, too small, that's too small, and this will be too big. Yeah, great. Sorry about this. It's not the sort of thing I wanted to be wasting time with. I've got one of these and one of those. They've got a special coloured bit on them. That would be a horrible bit of trial and error coming up now. Aha, uh -huh. I think this is good. This is going to have to be... Right, I'll keep it where it was. I'll know it's the right one. It's not that one, it's the thinner one. Right, so we're putting in our 7.25 inch uh, cool brass. No, it's not cool, it's the insert part. There it is. Um, I'm going to put these out of the way. That fire heater is nigh on useless. I don't honestly I think it's going to have to be retired forever shortly. Um, okay, that one is going to be for there. Okay, what was I going to do? Right, we've got the call in place. What we want is to get this in a place where we can get a squeeze like that. That's good without having to scrunch it into the wood. Good. Now we've got this here and I'm thinking shall we just try one without the crimping bit and just get a feel of what it goes down like once we've put it in place. So here we have it. Glue. The fret placed like so. Put it in its place, bring it back somewhere where it can squeeze. We don't want it squeezing too much on that. Something like that. Something is that pointing the wrong way, thank you. Something like that. Something like that. We'll get there in a minute. Get it set up for begin. Okay, so that feels very light. So straight away, there's no need to hold it there and press it any further. So I'm going to just wipe away the spare excess um, underneath and we're going to sort of examine it. Now the, the glue isn't ever going to be a terribly strong fixer. So the glue, if, if this isn't sitting where I want it right now, to begin with, then we aren't going to really get where we want to get. And the question is, um, at this point in the game, the question is how wobbly or otherwise will this be? Actually, that's not too bad. But I'm feeling, feeling, oh, this is a bit too wet. Let's just get we just need wet enough to wipe clean. So typically I would do that and that, that and that, that and that. And then usually this goes somewhere like that. I can grab it easily. And then a little bit of a clean over. Um, now the other way you can sometimes check if you really want to see if it's got any more movement is to put it back on there, um, line it up again, and then just press down again. And if you see it, it's not very hard to see from where you are, but if I see it squidge out much more, I can sort of see the amount of gi give that it's got. Um, now I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to leave that one, and I'm going to take the next one in both cases, and I'm going to do a little little twist at the f pretty much the far end of either of these. Now that's a little twist. I don't know really how much extra grip it's going to give, but I'm going to assume it's going to be a little bit more than none. Um, and again, I'll, I'll assess it again by feel. And if this time it 
feels better actually do you know what because I've got a bit of excess on there that isn't really right at the end is it so I'm going to do a little bit of a twist there and a little bit of a twist there so this is where I'm going to line it up here now because of that little twist it's not now it's not now going straight in which is kind of a good sign in one way it means that we're going to get a bit more of a bite on this as it goes in it's also going to be harder to get to go in in the first place like so because it's now wanting to fall fall off sideways right so you could feel that was a, a more of a <coughs> as it went in so that little bit of a bite there gave it something quite hard to bite against um, in some ways if it keeps the plate the ends of the frets where I want them I would prefer to do that than not now does it make a mess for somebody in the future nah not really it's just a it has a little bit of extra grip um, so the idea for now is if I can just test that again if I can get all of these uh, pressed in tonight then um, I can come back and finish. It's not going to be t uh, not going to be tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm jumping across to the two things tomorrow daytime. One of them is I'm going to do the final spraying on the G sorry the GS the ES three three three, and um, after that, while I'm doing it, in between doing that, I'm going to uh, do. What am I going to do? I'm going to do uh, Neil's GS Mini. So the ES333 for its final couple of coats, I really feel like I could do with bringing a blasted fire up here from somewhere because this is nonsense. It's terrible. Still, it gets there in the end, I think, but it's not brilliant. <laughs> when you do this with super glue it can be it can feel easier in that you tend to sort of hold it down for a bit until it the glue goes off and then you sort of know you know you're done um, and the good part about super glue it, but the bad part is that it's harder for somebody in the future to take it off or take the frets out it becomes a much crispier, crunchier activity. Um, but the good side is you can get straight on, pretty much straight on to um, doing the fret end beveling, whereas in this case I'm going to leave it overnight to be sure. So after a couple of presses, I'm going to look down here and in the light and I'm just going to sort of get a sense of the general levelness now, looking down here, not, the light isn't brilliant, but I'm not 100% convinced about this first one. So, much as it's not something I prefer to do, I'm going to remove this first one, and I'm going to um, just ascertain where the tangs will be. I'm going to do a little, couple of little bites here, and I'm going to encourage it to stick down this way maybe one in the middle as well just to help it so that's just a sort of quick look the other two look like they're doing well with that technique this first one was sort of sitting up a little bit I think so here we are going to encourage it to try and encourage it to sit down better now at the moment, it's now not wanting to. The, the twisty bit is now upsetting it slightly. <laughs> so I may have I may have twisted that one too much. In which case, I'm going to go and cut myself another one. If I can't just get this, oh, that should do. If I can get it to press in, I mean it's good. If I can get it to press in, everything will be fine, and it will just it will just go in nicely. But <laughs> no, it doesn't. It's not. Not happy yet. Is it happy? 
No, it's, it's trying to roll slightly to one side, I think. Um, okay, let's do another one. Uh, where's my cutter? Where's my cutter? Right, that one and that one. So that's a good thing of, about having the leftover stuff or the spare material. So I will still do a little, try a little tangs on here. Try maybe not to do so many. So the first bit of the refretting is, as you can see, is where you you sort of working out what's going to work and what isn't. Um, in that case. I just thought to myself, that method isn't going to work. Uh, it's not sitting quite where I want it. Now, what I don't know is whether that's the tangs are in the right place um, just yet. Let's get that to there. Let's get that over there. <laughs> so we don't mind about the excess sticking off at the side, that's inconsequential. What we want is the seating to be good. And hopefully with that little extra tang nibble, we should be in a better fit than before. I'll just go lightly, gently, lightly squeeze it again. feels about right. So it was good to have made up loads of uh, kitchen towel, little kitchen towel segments to begin with so I can quickly clean up. So now I'm looking down here again. I don't, I'm, ig I'm ignoring the, the stuff that's sticking out the sides. What I'm concerned about is the the general fit. This one still, this one still feels like it's too wide and it's lifting a bit at the end. Um, how much? A tiny bit. It is lifting a tiny bit. I think. I'm going to have to encourage it with a couple more little nibbles, I'm afraid. We need this to sit down. You understand? Well, you've got to sit down and behave. There's no alternative. Good. That's it's really hard to see in this light. Uh, that that's got a Definitely doesn't want to. It doesn't want to sit down there. That is. That is. There's something about this first one that it's it's too. It's a little bit too. Um, what's the word? Loose there. I'm gonna do a couple more little bites here. We've got to get it to sit down. I can't manipulate the knife at the moment. Sorry about this. So it's a bit, this first one is just buzzering me slightly. Now this is the opposite way round, so let's see if we can encourage it to sit where we need it. So, so we've got a start point here, which we need to tap, tap it down because it's not wanting to sit. See if we can get it to. Don't mind about the amount of 
glue going everywhere, just a minute. We want this to take a bite. We want it to sit in place, like so. And then we shall, we shall fret it and press it. Now the good thing about super glue is if you have this sort of situation where something uh, is, for example, you might be just at the very end of this slot may be wider and it just may be causing the whole thing not to want to sit properly. With super glue, you, you, super glue has the ability, obviously, to hold it down because it's actually doing some sticking. Whereas here, this, this glue is sort of doing a little bit of, um, I don't know, uh, it, it's, what's the word, um, fail safe, no, it's kind of just, it's a, ah, oh, I can't even think of the word, it's an insurance, you know, it's, it's adding an extra little bit of grip, but it's not really doing that much major, um, so, we shall see, this, if the first one, stays a problem we're going to have to rethink it and it's it's really mainly just going to be a, a problem of holding it down in the uh, slot but we shall see Let's give it a quick clean that's the only one i'll keep an eye out for the rest seem to be going in okay and that sort of technique that we've been doing. Also, the first one sometimes is hard to get access to because of the way this. Oh, I'm, you know I'm seeing here. I'm seeing. I'm seeing a little bit of the finish rucking up. I had that happen on the previous one due to the carpet spraying method. So maybe it is the carpet spraying method. That's pretty close, actually. So this is, as you can see, I'm I'm not doing super glue. I try to never do super glue anywhere near to um, gloss maple neck finishes because it's uncontrollable. Whereas this stuff, of course, the tight bond, you can easily clean up. Uh, super glue, you really can't. You've got a much difficult uh, problem. So my aim here is to make sure these darn things stay in. So I'm giving them as much encouragement as I possibly can, which includes falling over like that. So that's the only problem when you do the little tangs, that it doesn't want to fall in. Some people put a little notch into the beginning of the fret as they start. So that could be one thing, but... like that yeah some people kind of make a little v-shaped notch at the top of the fret slot to encourage the fret to go in and would probably help now i'm adding these little tang grips but you can see that once i once i get them to bite and see the, the first bit's the hard bit where they might because there's an extra little resistance to going in they they sort of want to fall over to begin with I think once they're being encouraged with the hammer to just take hold, then they seem to be okay. <sighs> with a bit of luck, we will be through. And if it, if the worst comes to worst, it may mean that the first fret ha requires a little bit of extra leveling. Um, that may be the case, but hopefully not too much. It'll, it'll reveal itself as we go through. Okay, so same old, same old. Uh, I could save you from the boredom of this, but um, maybe I won't since I'm running. Maybe I'll just go until the 
the camera runs out of juice. So I'm going to sort of make these little nips along here. Um, I'm trying to just think of how many and how much force to put on. That's the, that's the sort of secret. Just adding that little bit of gripness to it. It doesn't change the shape or anything like that. Just gives it a bit more of a bite. And then that careful tap in helps the process on its way. That's all right. It's feeling all right. I mean, the, the, you kind of know, you can see, start out, you can check fairly soon once you've started by, um, you know, you can get a fret rocker out at the end of laying all the frets and it'll sort of give you a fair idea. I've seen people in videos um, clamping frets overnight and I did that something similar years back, but actually I, I f discovered that if your fret isn't seated comfortably at the sort of basic height that it needs for you to be ready to just, um, you know, uh, level it off. If, it, if it's any further out than that, especially when you're working with, um, yeah, this first fret is, it's almost as if it's a different radius, but it can't be. See, and in some ways you could, if you had, um, that's, that's, that's very interesting. It's, it's, it's not if it's sitting, I've got a feeling this thing's sitting on this edge here. I think I probably need to sand that back further. I'm going to redo this one again, believe it or not. And I'm not going to take it from this piece of wire. I'm going to take it from over here. Not that you can see anything, but I'm just going to borrow this as a new one from over here. And I'm going to, before I do anything else, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, what am I going to do? Oh yes, I'm going to bring this file thing over here. In fact, I'm going to leave it for a bit, let it dry, because I think it's rucking up, I can see it's rucking up the edge of the finish. So I'm going to file it smooth so it's not causing that to happen. Hmm, very interesting. I think I'm going to have to re, re thing my opinion. I think these this was sprayed over because it has got a break in the finish, hence this little bit of puckering up that's going on, which I, I'm surprised at actually, but maybe then what it's telling me is that the, the, the fixture, the way of finishing that doesn't work is something to do with the, how crude the application is and um, how much finish is applied, because it's definitely not um, it's, it's nowhere near like the, uh, as bad as the um, American ones, Mexican, some, some of them. But I can still see that it's pressing, it's like uh, the, the carpet has been broken. And if it was sitting on top of it, the way I do it, then you wouldn't be saying it's, it's broken that way. So, who knows? Maybe it is sprayed over, maybe it's just a better job done than the Mexican and American factory sometimes does. Oh well, funny eh? Sorry. So I think what I'll do is I'll wait till this one dries um, sand that back again a little bit to clear the edge so it's not pressing, this fret isn't pressing down on the very edge. See that's the other thing that happened when when you when it's a discontinuous carpet or it's a carpet that's as I described it, it it's gone over the frets and then it's been broken by virtue of being um, pulled up to remove see that one This this one this one is not it's not it's not quite gripping right. Oh man. I hate this because every time we remove them now the, the fret potentially is is um is going out of shape. Okay, 
Come on now, play the game. Play the game, play the game, play the game, play the game. Say, so I needed repair wire. That's what I needed. So there's me going, oh yes, this feels like it's going to be a very straightforward job. And then you go, oh, wait a minute, that fret wire feels a bit too... The, the, these edges are ruled tighter than... Let's just have a... Sorry, you're not going to get this on camera here. I've just gone to the gone to the light. That, that. I'm just going to check my 7.25 again. Yeah, this is actually a bit tighter than 7.25. But then isn't this? Hmm. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's 7.25. Uh, 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 hmm, that's not so good. Come on now. Let's see what we got here. Sorry about this. I, I'm not happy with my radii. Let's just do this again a minute. Just going to try something else here. I'm going to over radius it from the damn thing. Right. <sighs> Don't like that. Don't like this. Don't like that. And it's just, just. Uh, it's, I think I've learned this tr problem before. Let's try this. This is a over radius. I need my cutters. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to accept that I may not like this radiusing. So I'm going to do the first fret again and obviously I'm going to need to do that little bit of tang uh, sanding at the area there but let's just let's just get that for the first one let's do the little bit of sanding so that we're not pushing on the edge of this I can see the little bit that's sort of wanting to get pushed out of the way it's there Okay, all right, let's take this one, let's do a little bit of tang nipping, not too much, either end and a bit on the end middle, a bit in the middle, let's get some glue in there. So this is over radiused, so this may be the solution I have to have here. Now the problem is, it's hard to over radius what you've already cut. So if I'm working on the wrong radius, I may find myself in trouble. Well, it's only a matter of some fret wire, but I can do that buying a ton more. Right, that's that. Let's go back in, sorry, and press this. I'm going to make, at the moment, I'm going to suspect all the ones I've done so far as not being necessarily good enough for my liking <sighs> but that's okay it's the most important thing you've got to get it right and if your radius you should you should never trust what the thing says if it's you know it's a vintage and you know it's a vintage 7.25 just as this wood seems to have expanded over time now all of a sudden this doesn't seem to be exactly 7.25 and I've cut it or I've, I've done my fret wire to 7.25 I don't think that was tight enough to hold it see that is perfect for fret number one that's as good as it's going to get so there we are so I'm going to suspect the following frets <laughs> uh, well, I'm gonna let's let's suspect them all and work the other way. Okay, I'm just gonna do that. 
So here we go. Let's go to the far end. Let's and let's see what we get. And if it all looks good, then we'll we'll bin those frets somehow, and we'll we'll use the spare. We should be able to get away with the spare from the other set. Um, anyway, different radius, but we should be able to do it. So let's go back to where's our things. Let's go just a bit in. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. I should probably run right to the edge because I'm trying to guess where the edge occurs and actually it's probably better that I don't guess it and just take it inwards from this edge until it just bites and that will work. Now stay there while I get you to a little, little bite to get going. Yep, that's good. So this way round Put that on there. Actually, I don't, don't need that for a minute. Put that on there. Put that on there. Um, on these, just put that one there and push. Easy to grip. Everything's fine. If I just line up. Oh, come on. <sighs> Let's just make sure that is actually on. Just, good pull and it's on nice clean cloth I didn't actually count the numbers that I'm going to question but we know it's everything back from where I'm getting to so on the last one possibly pull up the one before now a quick look down in the light yeah that feels okay that feels good Okay, we may have under-radiused in my... That's, you know, I've done that before, actually, I have to confess. Don't measure it standing up. There's gravity working on the blasted ring of wire. It could be pulling it down so it doesn't make any, bear any reference, and you think you've got it done and it isn't enough. So I, from now on, there's a few things I learn each time, and one of them this time is... When you think you're done, go... Oh shit, I've done the wrong one. Put that about there. Stupid me. What am I talking about? Come on, Sam. Get with it. You ain't doing that. You're doing this. <sighs> Sorry. Brain off. Um, yes, yeah, so, so don't judge the radius standing up. Come back to the bench and judge it there. That's what I've got to do. So I'm making new frets, remember? Yes, Sam. Get with it. Nip from the end inwards for a, a fair bit until you're sure you're into the very end of the fret. This feels like I'm nipping. Oh, I don't know what it's like. It looks like the a moth's eyebrows. <laughs> you know what I mean, perhaps. Right, so there we have it. Quite nicely nibbled all the way up the end there. The key thing is getting that first start point for the bite like that. Once you get that, get the press lined up lovely just feels feels good feels good I must keep an eye on the clock because if I don't I'm going to leave my wife standing in Tavistock looking for me and I won't be there <laughs> so for that I will need to go here 2033 I don't really want this near here but I need it to know what I'm doing Hope it's not going ninet, ninet, ninet all over the video. Okay, so I've got the technique. Now I have confidence in it. These feel like they're going home, going home nicely. So I can speed up a little bit and I'm going to have to cut myself another piece of wire um, or from the spares. But that's just going to have to be the way it is. So. I'm going to run out, I'm going to run out. I think I'll get by because there is enough, always enough over, le left over. Um, so I think I should be fine. Okay, so we're nibbling all the way from the end here. 
all the way in sufficiently to be certain I'm gripping the end, which I am. A few in the middle. Oh, and when I go home, then I'm going to have the joy of um, filling in a com co compensation form, claim form, for the county, Devon County Council, saying, give me my my precious last necessary hundred quid back. I, <laughs> I, it happened to me only once before, and this, it happened this time of year, and I guess it always does because the roads are in a crummy state by this time of year. So the roads are terrible, and I was out there driving to a band practice, and what I didn't, no idea, believe it or not, that my car was a few days out of or it's yeah, just missed its MOT. Yeah, um, and I wasn't paying attention to it, and I was just working and doing guitars. And anyway, I went out to a band practice uh, out in the countryside, and I turned a corner, and a, a, the weather had worn away this entire utility sort of manhole patch until the the superstructure of the manhole cover was visible, and it was a great chunk of jagged concrete. Normally, it's sort of buried under earth but anyway it's just visible and I I uh, turn the corner and it's kind of sticking out oh there's another car turning and, and anyway I, I sort of tight took the corner tightly because it was a farm vehicle turning and um, <laughs> I, I hit this bas blasted <coughs> blasted um, jagged bit of concrete and it popped my tyre good and proper and it had gone flat by the time I got to my bandmate's house which was in the middle of the countryside so we but I didn't know that and we so we went in rehearsed and I came out and it was freezing and it was dark and I was like oh no so I I went okay go let's go and look for the spare tyre I can do it it's dark I'll do it in the dark I don't care and um turns out oh look never even noticed since I bought this car Honda Civic that it doesn't have a spare tyre it only has a little thing in a bottle so I maffed around in the dark with you know jacking up the wheel freezing to death can't see a damn thing squirting this useless bottle of fuzzy stuff all over the place totally didn't do anything went flat again in seconds and um, so I was stuck in the middle of the night in this guy's driveway and very kindly he took me home Oh, no, anyway, the story was I, I got in touch with the AA, and um, there's a long story to this. The AA said, uh, oh, yes, um, okay, well, you haven't got cover for this, that, or the other, for some reason. I thought, how the hell? Anyway, so it turns out I was stuck there. She said, but this person said, what we can do is, um, what did she say? Something, she said, uh, you can renew it or something, uh, or you can sign up for it. So, it, it, anyway, whatever the deal was, it, it turned out that the only way I could sign up for it was um, by, because it was, uh, because it didn't have a valid MOT, they had to, I couldn't drive it, so they had to come and tow it for sure, and to tow it, not to a garage, but to my house, or no, to, I don't know where. Anyway, the, the bottom line is it cost me about £200 in a fresh high-end membership, um, for for a special tow from wherever you had to have a tow from, um, and then I I thought right I'm gonna I'm gonna bloody get the council to pay for this. This has really messed me around. It took days of taking the car, getting taxis back and forwards to try and get to the car and pick it up and all that stuff that gets involved when you do something like that. Lee could li ill afford it, and then I thought right well at least I'm gonna get me. Well somebody said you can get the money back from the council because that is terrible so I took pictures of it <coughs> and everything and I thought right I've got all I need I've got pictures I've, I've got a watertight case and I went back online and I started filling in the whole thing feeling full of uh, righteousness and then it said uh, um, was your car MOT'd at the time of the accident at the time of the the yeah the impact with the, the road furniture and um I just realised that it wasn't, and there was no way I was they were going to um, pay me out because of that, uh, and so I <laughs> just had to give up, and it cost. Luckily, it wasn't as expensive as I thought it was going to be. It was only about 120 quid for a new tyre, you know, in total, 
and it didn't need the whole new alloy and whatever going around it. But um, that learned me that we were just a couple of days outside. And I think they'd, what had happened is they'd stopped notifying us of MOTs. The garage always used to do it, but for some reason they stopped that method and uh, it was up to you to remember, which of course we just didn't notice. Anyway, so we got uh, caught out and um, but thankfully it wasn't too expensive. But this time it's in MOT and you, Devon County Council, you deserve to pay. So I've got my photos of this hole in the ground. Right. I'm going to need to make some more tighter. Well, I could try and bend these frets tighter. See if we can get, get somewhere with that. Anyway, I've only got a certain amount of time, so I, I can do what I can do. It's, I really wanted to finish this and have it drying tonight, but I could finish it tomorrow if necessary, along with the other stuff I'm doing. So fingers crossed, I will get my money back out of the council. I don't know how it works, but apparently people say you will, you know, if you if you get some good pictures of the pothole and can show something to give an idea of its scale and extent and depth and so on. So, so I risked my life getting those pictures and I'm sure they're going to be effective in getting me compensated. funny part was because I went looking for it I was f to begin with every time well when I drove past it I was looking for the um I was looking for a proper pothole and it's only today that I realized it was it was a sort of trench following the center line of the road which then kind of led up to the um that thing the cat's eye and the, on its own you can hit cat's eyes of course because they're de designed to slope and so on um but when there's a hole leading up to them, a trench leading up to them, then the cat's eye kind of foundations are sticking out as well as the cat's eye. So it's a pretty nasty impact. Anyway, we shall see. Um, I got given a, a geo, I've been as geo the other day by one of the nice people on the site here. A couple of the lads know that I do something with guitars and so they... If they ever find a, a guitar in the in their rubbish recycling rounds, um, they very kindly bring it up and leave it outside the door. So I came up the other day and there was this tired looking geo outside, but actually good enough to put back together with spare parts and whatnot. So it, it's uh, it's another spare parts caster in the making. The basics are okay, um, but. It could be also refinished, and I, my brother had rung me the, that morning, asking me. He's he's doing a, a sort of uh, what's the word? Speculative. He's a motorsport uh, host and presenter, and he's doing a a sort of short Formula Ford championship, like a mini championship. Anyway, and he's kind of working out all these different prizes to give in this championship and there's not a lot of money and he said um, did I have a real of guitar sitting around that we could use as part of the overall championship prize you know just in return for a bit of publicity and whatever um, a few words from the sponsor kind of malarkey anyway I, th I thought it'd be quite a fun idea and um, but at the time I didn't really have anything and then that same afternoon I came out here and the Geo was just sitting there propped against the door. So I thought, actually, if that isn't a, a message, I don't know what is. So the Geo is going to be the uh, championship guitar and it'll be uh, either done in a spray color job that's championship colors or it will have, you know, kind of a checkered flag wrap or, you know, some nice 
classic go faster stripes type of rap or something like that. And of course, the DiGio is not bad for that because it's it's not overly curly and curvy, whereas you know often strats tend to be. Um, so this is not bad. So what I'm going to do, because I need to get this done, I am going to cut. I'm going to guess a piece of. I'd say this is a. What are we talking about? That's that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's nine out of twenty-two. That's just under half, just under half of what we what we need. So I'm going to cut one of these down. Uh, so that's just under half. That's going to go like that. Uh, no, let's see. We're going to get. Hang on a minute. That's not going to be so cool. We're going to get that's a meter. Blah, blah, blah. We've got that bit there, which we could bend a bit further, and we've got that bit there. I'm going to see if we can just tighten these cur curves up a bit. Yes, we can. And get as many frets out of this bit as we can without needing to uh, try and hand bend any of those, which we will do if we have to. So I'm just going to try and oops, go back. Get the thing, 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 thing. Let's just double check here. Yeah, that's a nice overcut. There's going to be plenty of grip going on there. I'm going to leave them in line as we're going to use them coming this way. Get as many of these done now as we can. Coming this way. One, two, three. Oh, well, there's a bit of waste. Sorry about that. Here, one, two, three, four. And we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, and six. We should get now all the ones we've got there are now longer, so that should be easier to trim and use if we can. I'm just going to get these in and ready because they're working quite well now. I just need to pinch them, crimp them, and get them in. Now the method's working out nice. Um, we, could, we could reuse these better. In fact, we'd be better off getting a, some extra, extra fret wire. Let's do something. We did that one, that worked well, didn't it? Yes, that worked well. Where's my thing? Now this stuff we're going to we're going to pull that one, we're going to pull that one, we're going to pull that one, and we're going to pull this one. <laughs> Much as I don't like wastage. I'm going to put those. Those could be reused because they'll be tighter than the 9.25 of the other guitar. Get my drift? So that's out too. So now we're going to take a bit more of the other one as well. I'm going to steal it. I'm going to take a bit of this. Let's take that much. Let's bend it. And we'll get all of this done tonight. We must do. Right, we've got a tight radius. Good. Let's get these first ones in. Let's nip them and go. Nip, 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 and nip. Anyway, so this has been very boring, hasn't it? I've got nothing world chattering to tell you other than this is how it goes uh, as you figure your way along a refret of something that has oddly loose slots <laughs> but you have to overcome it as you go I just dip my sleeve in there that's good that had to happen so tapping it in followed by now this has to come the other way now followed by Squeezing it, squeezing it down. Let's just line this up properly. Thank you. Tapping it in, squeezing it down. We'll go over all of these with some uh, wet cloth in a minute. So, yes, this is how it goes. And the important thing is to be adapting on the way. If you find that it isn't going according to plan, um, you just have to 
I think what I'll do is I'll just tap these all in first and then we'll press them in Whoop, together. Come on. Yeah, just it, you've, it's so important that you've got to work out what's working and what isn't and be ready to change direction on this. So my mistake was I did a I should have done check the radius when I had done it. I should have sat down or sorry, brought it to the bench and checked it there. And instead I I guessed it standing up or I checked it standing up which was suboptimal say the least. Um, and the result is as you see a bit of a rapid look out. So we're sort of uh, making use of the excess material that we get from both sets of frets and we're going to reuse some of these not tight enough for 7.25s but more than tight enough for 9.5s which we're going to do with the Made in Mexico which this other set of fret wire was for so thankfully we'll we'll make it work without wasting or having to buy more um, which is good so as you can see I'm sort of zipping along here to get these in um, and press down and everything will be fine. One more to get down and then we'll wet it up and clean it up. Okay. Today's film, <laughs> today's movie, before I came up to the workshop, today's afternoon movie was um, I can't remember what it was called now it's no good is it if I'm going to tell you about a good film all I know now is that it had um, it had Edmund O'Brien who I like I first saw in The Barefoot Contessa with Humphrey Bogart with, and uh, Ava Gardner which I were one of my favourite films of all times and uh Loved, loved him in that, and uh, now sort of find him in all other things. He was he was never a sort of he was always a. Oops, I'm doing a quick way now. He was always a. For the style of the day, he was always a. He was kind of like, the, sweaty overweight man type of thing, um, although actually by today's standards he's not at all. You know you wouldn't call him overweight, <laughs> by modern standards, but. Uh, you know, compared to the pencil-thin people immediately post-war, he, he certainly was. Um, but he's a, a great um, sort of very sympathetic act character most of the time, even when even when he was playing a sort of slightly cynical character in uh, the um, Barefoot Contessa, Oscar Muldoon. He was he was lovable. He couldn't. He couldn't hate him. In the end, you had to like him. But yeah, not a not a leading man as such. But he was in this film today, actually. Um, no, actually, no, it's not true. Who was the leading man? It was not. What's his name? Um, oh lordy, not um, Widmark. Richard Widmark. No, no, not Richard Widmark. Who have we got? Oh blimey, who are the big names of that time? Forgotten who it was. Not Gregory Peck. No, not Richard Woodmark. No, not Bob. Bill. Bob. Robert Mitchum. No. Oh man, this. I watched it this afternoon. That's it. I've, I've lost my mind. Right now, as you can see, I'm going to now zip along here. <sighs> if I can bring my damned cutters. I'm going to zip along here and get this one done. And I'm going to leave all the rest of the tidying up to tomorrow when I come back up to do the spraying because I have to so can we get have I cut it right to get the rest of these out we'll see one two three and four five that's all we need four and five not done four and five 
go down. And we'll keep this bit off here because we know it's a tight radius. And we'll get this bit piled up ready. Messy. Oh man, I can't even remember the... It was a, like a... It was a bit like a... <laughs> Clark Gable? No. No. Um, Gregory, Gregory, Cary Grant? No. Gee whiz. No, I've completely forgotten who it was. It's a sort of... He, he was the normally the kind of action, or the hero type. Um, but Edmund O'Brien played the, the lead role. So that would be that one, right? Down there, I think so. This will be the long one, right? Anyway, and I can't tell you what it was called, so it was good. I did see one called yesterday called the Browning version. It was all about a, a miserable old master in an English prep school, um, starring Michael Redgrave, who I'd never really seen or paid any real attention to, but he was brilliant in this. Um, and plays this sort of uh, uh, old Latin classics master in a sleepy British school with cricket goes on and uh, he's leaving and he's been a tyrant to the kids and there's just one boy who brings him out of himself and shows him how to redeem himself a little bit and it's very touching I enjoyed that. The Browning version, an odd title. It refers to a, <coughs> a book that the boy gives the master. Anyway, I'm just nipping these and whizzing through, and I should be lining up as soon as I can to finish. Ow, I hurt my finger. But we're nearly there. Come along. So yeah, a bit of a detour on this one. We'll have to do a bit of careful husbanding of fret wire for the other one at 9.5. But those 7.25, slightly over 7.25s, will do fine work as the 9.5s. Obviously, they'll be m m a bit over tight at this point in time, but they'll they will work in the end fine. They'll flatten out a bit. It's very, I, I, it, it's hard to sometimes assess how valuable it is to under radius in terms of tight, you know, make it tighter than it needs to be. Um, sometimes you, you find yourself trying to get it exact and actually there's no real reason that, this, in fact, it's not good at all. You really want to do it tighter. It should be a sort of standard thing to make sure it's tighter because that will stand you in better stead. <laughs> no no reason to get it the exact radius at all. Right, just getting as much of this off as I can before getting the cloth on it. <laughs> Checking the time. We'll be on 45. Oh, 58. Damn, I'm going to be late. But we are pretty much done. <laughs> I can text and say I'm running five or so minutes late. I'm just going to try and get this go off the side here as much as possible. And here. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Go back in. <coughs> Press last few again. One. Okay, okay, that's today's fun and done. I'm going to get out of the way and get off and collect the wife. The wife! And hopefully we'll come back to this day after tomorrow. And it will be pretty good, I think, compared to where it was going. Um, okay, thanks for watching. See you again in a bit. At the moment... Hence I'm swaddled up. <laughs> so let's, let's uh, zoom quite a way out. There's no, 
I'm not going to do anything terribly detailed here. Let's just make sure you're... There we are. Get in there and stay there. Uh, something like that. Okay, so the end beveling. So what I've done is I've cut them all as short as they can be. And now we're going to use the end beveling block. And I've got it propped this way so it can't push that way. And I've got it held down here. And we're going to use the block gently to begin with. Quite a long bit over the end here. So I'm just going to try and sort of tame that. So what I haven't done is checked its general levelness yet, so I will aim to do that once I've done these ends. Now this is moving a bit, so I need a bit of grip on there. And, uh, you'll notice that I'm holding down the top of this block because it's very easy for it to run away. Um, and if it does, we this file will skip across the top of the frets and ruin them. Well, it won't ruin them. It will just give me a, a lot more work to do to level them. So uh, I'm being very careful. So there's always a restraining hand. hard to cut that end fret. It's trying to, it's trying to avoid being included. Uh, so the idea is we just nibble away at this until we get flush with the edge and then we roll in a little bit. Now I got a guitar come in for a customer of mine yesterday, something that he bought privately. And uh, the first thing I noticed about it was that the frets were very sharp. And they didn't seem to me to have been end beveled. Uh, but they had been beveled, but they'd been kind of cut off flat. A very odd sort of finishing. Um, and I, I, you know, I of, often, well, always when somebody buys a guitar from a private in a private sale and has it sent to me directly. Obviously the first thing I do is evaluate it, make sure A, it's arrived safely, B, that it's, uh, you know, it's what it says it is and so on. Because obviously I'm not going to start doing any work on something if it turns out that the, uh, that the thing is, needs to be sent back. So uh, I have a good look at these frets. I'm going to have a closer look later on and take some pictures because I think uh, my customer has gone back to the seller and said hmm this is a bit kind of unfinished in the fret department and as far as I understand the seller is refuting that a little bit uh, so uh, we don't want to get into a, a big fight about it um, there is there's something definitely not right about the frets on that guitar and it's it wasn't even something I saw to begin with it was something I felt with my fingers so when you get a, a new guitar in you obviously handle it um, and the first thing I thought was wow that's sharp what's sticking out and it turns out that uh, the frets were kind of odd. Anyway, I'll get some pictures of it later on and I will place it on the Facebook page and can have a see. I didn't want to, I mean, I, it's not my, it wasn't my intention to start out just by being critical of a, a private maker's build. Um, but, you know, you have to say what you see. Um, if the thing is problematic, then you know I may my my sense straight away was what I'd need to do is to go over the whole thing with 
uh, this beveling block. Um, there are a few other things not right on that guitar. So now I'm scuffing, scuffing the uh, finish here, which means we're right on the edge. Um, yeah, there's a few other little things that aren't quite right that I would need to put right. So there's a bit of extra, whoops, a bit of rework, if you like, involved. So the difficulty here is when you, in order to be flush, so there's no sticking out bit of metal, you have to make contact with the finish on the edge. And if you make contact too heavily with the finish on the edge, or if there's a bit of a curvature, what you get is a, you, you get, you'll pull away some of the finish. Now in this case, I've managed to sort of rud, uh, hit it a bit, um, and it's not too bad, but it's always going to be a, a bit of a candidate for some uh, refinishing touch-ups at the edge. So I'm always on the lookout. So this one down the end is hard to include in the beveling part. It doesn't quite want to work at the same angle as the rest. Just because it's the it's the outlier, I suppose. Okay. It's feeling pretty good. Let's have a look. So what have we got? What have we got? Well, there's a little bit of finish taken up. See what happens is where the, it's uneven anyway, the uh the, the what do we call this thing? The end beveling file will scuff it um, and it will find the spots that aren't quite even uh, which is I guess there's no way around that so I've got a bit of glue still on here which I'm going to try and just gently rub off with a bit of water failing that if it doesn't come off with water then we can take it off with a bit of um, naphtha which I'll do. So that that's looking okay. Um, probably doesn't need too much or hardly any in the way of touching up. Might just be a bit of uh, polishing with some micro mesh. Um, so let's have a kind of look at it in close up. First side. Oops, that's not close up, is it? That's more like close up. So there we have it. Uh, there you go. So you can see where the fret, the edge beveling file has connected a little bit now and then with the finish on the edge. But that has to happen. If it doesn't happen, um, then you won't get it flush. And if it isn't flush, you will guarantee that the uh, metal fret ends will protrude. And in doing so, you will get bits sticking into your hands, fingers. So what we will do afterwards is we can also do a little bit of hand refinishing if we want to, or hand, yeah, hand finishing. We can roll these a little bit, so we just make sure that the tang is absolutely flush in case if there's anything trying to stick out. We can just tame it like that and roll it. Um, makes a kind of nice smooth finish. But the damage here where I don't know what's happened in the past. Maybe it's been squeezed when somebody's put it. it. It looks a bit compressed where it's been pushed into the neck in the past, but in the first place, maybe at the factory. But anyway, so this is a this is a very pleasing kind of pastime. It's not actually that productive um, because what you find is as soon as you go over this with the other files, you change the shape of these end bits and you end up going over it again but it feels nice and it gives it a uniform shine. You can achieve something similar with a pad and some sandpaper as well going on at, a, at the angle you've just beveled it at. So, um, so there's a, bit of, a little bit of uh, scuffing there. The truth is, if we did this with uh, some micro mesh and did some 
sanding from about 1500 upwards, we would return all of this to, um, it's not through the wood, so we'd get it all back to uh, a nice um, gloss finish anyway, if necessary. So it may not require sitting at home with a little brush, but if it does, it's, no, it's not a big deal really. Whoop. I've done it many a time and spent many a relaxing late evening uh, touching up the edge. And then you sand the whole lot back and the edge it blends into the original. Um, now this is, I'm pretty certain this is polyurethane. Um, but I haven't done a test, uh, and I would before adding finish to finish. So I'm starting off by beveling at a bit of an angle. It, it kind of makes it easier to get going. The, uh, the end by the heel always takes more work because there's more frets, there are more frets together. So you, so it takes longer to get these done than the single frets further up. You can see dust, fret dust building up. When you're using it up here, you've got to watch out for this edge of the headstock here. You can't catch that as you come back or else you will damage, damage the, uh, the wood in the finish, which I've done in the past by enthusiastic, over-enthusiastic edge beveling. Get into quite a exertion doing this but it's it's good so looking at the way there's a bit of um i don't know the word is a little bit of lifting of the finish is not i don't like that's what i don't like about these carpet finishes and i've concluded this has to be a carpet finish even though it's a much better done one but it, but the effect we're getting down here is, is exactly why i don't like it because it's crimping and sort of causing it to lift slightly and really you don't want that uh, to be the case had a, a good day today last well the whole of this week has been busy and good we've got loads of little things achieved uh, today I had a, a good old customer come around and bring a, a few guitars some of which are staying with me to set up and some some of which aren't um, just going back to be played but today also uh, the Toolstream company brought back my planar thicknesser, my Triton planar thicknesser, repaired. I mean, it's in the back of the car. I haven't got the strength right now to bring it upstairs. Um, now this is this is uh, because of the edge of this is a bit old. It's sort of trying to it's trying to cut the finish a bit now. Um, so it's very difficult to get this to cut exactly vertical without taking any of the finish off and it is taking some off there um, as you know all, when it's all when all's said and done I don't mind doing a bit of painting on of replacement finish if that's necessary um, but you know it would be great not to have to do that now I'm leaning it over for the angle on the bevel and 
this is a, a very different shape end bevel well oh, sorry the the fret is different from before in that if you remember the frets didn't come quite to the end of the fingerboard and now they do so it's quite a different a, bit, a greater width okay so scuffed up a little bit in places but like I say if you don't do that you won't get this smooth uh, join and you get bits of metal sticking up which is not what you want so looking at this now that's kind of sitting down nice and flat if I'm feeling courageous at this point I can try and find me uh, I don't know where I've put them now try and find me a fret rocker and see just how many are way out and how many are okay a little bit a little bit a bit there that one's quite a lot that's interesting that one that one is weird that one is sticking up in the middle can I see it sticking up I can that's an oddity now in this case if this uh, if this is no good I'm going to replace this one that's that's not gonna I'm not gonna have that mess things up I can see it now under this light um, the rest are the way I f can feel it are within the sort of normal range of things but this one here this one here is not good so we're going to immediately prepare ourselves a strategy we do anything else so so we need to get this sorted out so I'm going to check me a bit of uh, spare wire I'm just going to double check its radius okay that's quite quite heavily overbent um, don't have very good grip now at the moment too far off okay so although I don't much like the thought of this I'm going to take the plunge uh, and I'm going to remove said uh, said fret right said fret that's a shame but there we are I'm going to remove it and I'm going to with the glue in there what it won't do is sit back down and behave itself <laughs> if you get what I mean so it's coming out and we're going to redo it I've just gone look at me look at me look at me an absolute plonker I've just gone and pulled the wrong one yeah should we cut the video on there or should we just show what a complete idiot I am that one can stay there. This is the bad one that's coming out, isn't it? That's right, Sam. Great. Wazak. Now this one is beautifully seated at the ends, so much so that it doesn't want to come out. Okay, two come out, two are out. Now I'm going to get me, uh, oops, sorry, spare piece of this, and I'm going to put it through the same bender because I want the right wire. I'll worry about the next guitar afterwards if I have to, which I have to. That's okay by me. Right. So let's have a look. I don't like this end here. I'm going to lose that. One, 
too. Okay, so we've got some catching up to do on that. So let us get the thing. I'll probably just use the press over there right now and just get it done. out nicely. Thank you. Let's use these little edge sanders again. Now, if I was clever, I would press these in being very careful with super glue. And the reason for that is that it would allow me to carry straight on. Um, so with kind of necessity in mind, I probably will do that. <laughs> Could do that. Don't have to. Could. Clear. So we know, we know that one's going to be there, and that one's going to be there, right? Or the other way around, there and there, that way and that way. Okay, so we're going to put some little nicks on there, and we can, uh, we can, what am I going to do it with? Uh, this one here. Sorry about this, a little detour now. So, as a sort of technique of get out of jail free-ishness, I'm going to attempt to use this, uh, I'm going to use a bit of one of these little tiny nozzles up here from my glue boost. In fact, I could use the thin master glue here, which I haven't yet used, and a, one of its little things. Um, I could use this instead. So I guess the secret or the, the challenge here would be to get this in without uh, that's not I'm going to cut that off first um, yeah to get this in there and get it working without spilling it anywhere um, oh, look at what I've just done that's too wide now isn't it duh you have to cut the top off but how can you get that over there if you it's not a very good invention, is it? I'll try this one. It'll just about go a bit better. Okay. So, so what we will look to do is let's let's nip up this business first, as of before. Um, so that's. Autopilot brain offness going on there. So we could try and run some into there, um, like so. It's actually bloody hard to work it. So that's on there, like that. So we can go one, two, three, four. Get the other little bit of wood out, which I've now lost. Oh, brilliant. Where did you put it? Uh, oh, okay, that's bear with me. Where is it? Oh, no, there it is. Why did I put that away? What was I doing? <laughs> that looks pretty good. Yep. So 
sorted that bit and then we will do the same again with this one. In some ways it would probably be good to have the mm, press up here but never had enough room. So this is a very small amount of super glue and it's not enough to come whoop, to go messing up the top. What did I just do with the hammer? I just put it over there. Ay ay ay. Um, but it is enough to hold it in once it's down. Very good. Well, with a bit of luck, that should all be sorted. A sort of quick get out of jail -y sort of way. And what we then want to do is cut these off as close as we can to the edge, like so. And we could either do them by hand or we could use the block again. Um, or sometimes you could use a, a, a Dremel thingy. But let's just see if we can quickly do it with the block. So that was a, a rescue scenario. Thanks, that's good, but no good. Thanks, but no thanks. Right, there's our two. Should be fairly quick. Seeing as they, there's only two to take down. that's uh, the bevel okay and I just want to run down here and that's just sort of snipping off any uh, vertical bit so just as a check yeah, a million times better so that was a good mm, change rescue fix but that's how it goes sometimes you, you, for some reason that you may not have realized or can't explain why now <coughs> uh, that didn't that didn't turn out right to begin with so we now just had to put it right I'm going to try and lean over here because I want to be alongside it or more above it, I should say. So I'm just bringing the bevel in to match the others. Okay, that's all good. <sighs> so, so the first little test with the, um, the fret rocker there was really my way of telling or assessing whether this is close to being a good fretting or whether it's going to require a lot of extra remedial work in the, uh, the fret leveling. And actually, I don't want it to sound like it's a a negative because no um, no uh, Noah no fretting ever comes out ready 
to play without needing to do the leveling so it's a it's a absolute bog standard part of it so i never feel bad about having to do leveling all i'm really concerned about is how much leveling i have to do um, and the, le the less the better but there's always some to do uh, so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to use a bit of this uh, that stuff Coleman's just to clean the bits of uh, glue off the end or anything that's still on there. There's something on there, I don't know what it is. is it, I don't know if it's glue, but it's going to come off. Next stage was if that didn't come off with the uh, Coleman's, then I would use a very light um, uh, buffing paste. So this should take off all of the glue, any of the glue that's overspilled and give me a sort of reliable reading of the state of the neck. So these feel sharp now, which is absolutely no surprise they would. Um, and so the next thing we do is we take this file and the job is to stay there. Oh, sorry. We're now going to um, kind of round off the frets. Now this rounding business slightly spoils when you get an almost machine-like straight edge along here. Um, it, it can it can feel like doing this upsets that sharp looking edge but the problem with clean sharp looking mechanical edges is that's when they're going to be sharp to the touch so you, you sort of you have this choice you either have them robotically precise and sharp or you have them a little bit more rustic and smooth uh, soft and smooth so I think for the playing side of things I go for softer and smoother so of course these as mentioned just now these these frets are already longer than the previous ones because they come right to the edge of the fingerboard whereas the other ones didn't so um, so sometimes if I um, gauge that the the frets are fairly unlevel or there's a quite a lot to level then I might use and have used in the past a leveling block at this point a radius block um, to do it all in one go the, the problem with the leveling block is that it imposes or the radius block sorry it imposes its radius onto your frets and so the this neck is old and it's organic and for all we know it may be slightly off the original 725 it may be seven and a half or it may be 6.79 or you know it's it's not necessarily going to be exactly the same radius as the radius block that i pick up which will be made to a, a another template or another um, calibration if you like um, so if i go if my radius sanding block is one radius and I go over it, over this, with that radius and they're different, then I'm going to take off you know, a fair bit of fret metal in, in making this radius the same as the, the block. And there's no real need to do that. And I'm looking here and I'm thinking, at this end, there is a bit of scope for adding a, a tiny bit of um, finish, um, which I might do from home. Um, it depends. It, it, it depends whether it ends up being worth it to do it, or whether it's just a completely sort of. Well, we were just doing it for sort of aesthetic sake. You know, it's, the matter is more about does it play? Can does it feel nice? So what I'm doing is I'm just rolling off these bits of the frets now, keeping it a narrow bit of filing. So this is a slightly different file. I'm going to go. 
over it with this file again to make sure there are no sharp corners. Now I guess what some people do is if they do go over the edge of this neck with some poly, or I guess it's poly, let's assume it's poly for now, if they do go over, if I were to go over the edge here, um, it just, it does two things, it, it kind of makes continuous this bit of poly on the edge so it sort of seals it back off, um, but it also puts a layer of finish over these, sorry, over these little fret ends you can see, um, which again doesn't look bad at all, it looks like it's somehow part of the thing. Um, so I'm just rounding these off and in doing this by hand I can catch any little burrs of the tang sticking out which is definitely what we don't don't want. So this little bit of filing here catches that and rounds it off. And then we go down the other side doing the same thing. Nice little file for this. This is a Stumac file. It's you know, as with everything Stumac, it's more expensive than finding it, finding an equivalent tool somewhere over here or even in the guitars and woods in Portugal. But um, Stumac, I've always found, has great customer service and to the point that if you bought a tool and it wore out worryingly early, I've heard very good customer service feedback you know about them refunding and doing whatever's required to put it right so you know it's, it's it account it counts for a lot to have that sort of customer service on whatever you buy okay so the plan tonight it being friday night at the move is is to finish this off and I think what I might do is do this finish it off uh, to the point of not quite putting the strings on um, I'm going to put obviously I want to put some I want to put this back neck back on and do the fret leveling so I'm going to put sacrificial strings on the, the original ones are waiting to go back on um, and once I've done the fret leveling and the polishing out and all of that We'll change the bridge saddles over for the brass ones. And then it'll be a matter of, I think I'll probably take it home then and do some finish touch-ups at home where I can just leave this on the table. Um, leave it on the dining room table and just add, with the paintbrush, just add a, a little bit of finish as I go past it every half an hour. And it builds up a nice extra bit. And then normally, uh, what I can do is very lightly, carefully sand it back with 1500 or 1000 through to 12,000 micro mesh, um, and, th <coughs> and then just uh, shine up the edge with uh, a little bit of car polishing compound. And all that I can do at home in, you know, under more relaxed and warmer conditions. Um, and sometimes it's good to take these files back as well because I can, whenever if I ever encounter a rough bit, I can always run over with these files again like this, which is always very nice contemplative ASMR practice. So that's all of those, and that's starting to feel good already. It's still a little bit sharp, so what I'm now going to do is I'm now going to run up in the corner of each of these and run, sort of take away the little sharp bit in the corner and just roll up and over the fret end as well. So hopefully everything facing the fingers has got some rounding off going on. There are no little sharp burrs in the corner and we sort of connect this file with the previous file's work. And then once I'm confident that it's in a nice playable state on the ends, then we can wait till I've done the leveling and then include the fret ends in the leveling 
the sanding out process. Um, and that helps to kind of soften everything out to the same kind of level. And then I think we can then put the little bit of finish if we need any on the edge here. We could probably just polish this up, but I'm conscious it's taken a little bit of the amber color it where it's made contact with the file. So we could probably do with a little bit of stain in there, with some poly at home, and just gently return some of the color to the very edge. No harm in that. And then we sort of sand that back out and polish it out as a final step. So that's that side done. And then we come back. So that's starting to feel pretty good. And then we come back to this side. And do the same. So this sort of detail now, um, and then the precision fret leveling in a minute, these are the things that the factory very, very rarely does. Um, what they do in the factory sometimes is they've, they've got wise to the fact, fact that unless they do some sort of fret leveling, they're sending out a guitar that the customer, when they get it out of the box, very often will not be able to set a lower action um, because the fact is that most electric guitars are limited by their, their action setting is limited by the uneven frets in the, in the neck. Um, so to not do anything is to send out a guitar that pretty much can't be lowered from out of the box and most people get it out of the default setting from the factory and want to lower it because they're usually quite high because they're normally set to over step step over the high frets. So having a customer feeling like they can't do anything um, because it won't tolerate it is not a good thing. So it's far better that um, it, they do what, the, what I call the block radius block leveling. And when they do the radius block leveling, um, it's very quick. Um, it's quite rough in a sense, but it's quick and the good thing about it is that they can get some leveling done with very short space of time and from a factory's profit point of view that's a really good uh, situation so they get that done and then they get the factory uh, get the, the neck over to the buffer give it a buffing and it's on its way out the door so yeah this is quite a tight tight fit in here so, um, let's get our things that we're going to attach. Yeah, so, so, so those kinds of fret levelings um, are not as good as this because they don't re-crown the frets. They just uh, basically level it and then um, buff the polish or polish or buff the levelled part um, and it's to be fair it is much better than not doing it at all so um, I'll give them that much but it you know it you can spot it straight away and you know the, the issue is would I rather they didn't do it no I'm, I'm far prefer that they do it um, but it's just you can see the difference between that and getting it um, done nicely the way we're going to or we're doing it and the uh, the difference I suppose in practical terms is a matter of money and time um, because you'd need somebody to spend time uh, getting it done as I'm doing now so I know which way around my plate is there I'll just hold it there cleaned it off with a bit of uh, thingy cellulose thinners now I was going to think did it at this point was I going to check? I'll do it inside. If I'm going to do a check for what the finish is, I'll do it inside the uh, tremolo uh, cavity. It's probably the best place to do it. So now I've got my correct order of things. I've got my plate facing the same direction as before. And I've got my screwdriver charged up, ready. So I'll go to the opposite now, and then that, and then that all good on four 
on the thing. That should be about right. About right. Okay, so now we have our refretted neck back on, and we're obviously going to return our pickups. No, our tuners. That's what we're going to do. We're going to refit our tuners. Um, Let's see what we can see here. We have to zoom out a long way. Good. Uh, oh, very good. There are our tuners. Doodly 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 do. Boom. There you go. Something like that. Um, I'm just thinking, having done this, I probably want to press in uh, my, what do you call them, these things. If, if they need to get pressed in, I probably ought to press them in now, soon, first, before I do anything else. If they need some a slight bit of tapping, um, then we'll do that. Ah, uh, yeah. So, a, a very, I, I'm very pleased that the tool station people um, were good enough to take my uh, that thing, that thing that's called. Um, one second. I'm just going to make a cut, and I'll finish my sentence then. I promise you. Um, Yes, that my planar thicknesser that broke, uh, I think it was about six months ago it started going wrong, or it, it just broke, it stopped. It went, the kind of motor sort of started to run at the intermittent. It's like hunting. Anyway, um, so I did a load of research, and it turns out that the word on the street was that it's probably, it was probably my, that thing, actuate, no, uh, armature, you know, the motory bit. Anyway, um, having kind of got, discovered that, I thought I would have a look at replacing it. Um, and I actually found one for sale, which was good, about 48 quid or something. And um, the... I bought one and it came and I had seen online somewhere with instructions how to replace it but then of course having seen that once uh, I could never find those instructions again and when I started to have a go at doing it it was far more complicated than I wanted to deal with so I was sort of about to give up and then I just had a, a, a thought and the thought was something like hang on when did I buy this and how old is it and so I happened to go and do a bit of looking back and to my amazement I discovered that it was, uh, that it had apparently a three year warranty on it and, and to my surprise it was about three weeks short of three years. Um, so I contacted them and a very kind woman called Megan replied to me and said Yep, it's within the three years. If you uh, would like to get it packed up, I'll organise a collection, which she did. Um, and in a sense, I saved them a bit of money because I've paid for the uh, armature. Um, so they got away. No, they didn't get away with it. They just uh, didn't have to pay that bit. So I don't mind at all. I've got, I'm just amazed that I've got my... Uh, well, it's out in the car, I haven't got it out, but I'm almost certain that I'll have got my planar thicknesser back in working order, which to me is a, is a superb outcome for very little uh, outlay other than time on the phone and um, you know, the cost of the, arm, uh, the, the spare armature thing. So I'm just going to slightly enlarge these holes the reason being, um, 
the tusk um, screws are just a tiny bit bigger and obviously I don't want them to cause any splitting in the finish or the wood so it doesn't hurt to just help that uh, along the way a bit. So here we go. So we had originally two string trees so we're going to give it two two of the tusk ones like so to go with the tusk nut and the nice new brass saddles. So the idea now at this stage is as always we're going to um, we're going to need to fit everything really so we might as well get ready to fit the nut. Now the nut is going to be um, the nut is going to be hopefully a direct replacement. This one looks a bit taller though so I'm slightly nervous about this. If it turns out to be taller then I could be in a bit of a, a challenge because this one here it currently stands on a little footing but that's really only meant for uh, flat bottomed slots. So this is a rounded curved slot and so if I'm going to use it it's going to require taking this little bit off which is which will be best done with a, a Dremel type a Dremel type mm, uh, sanding barrel thing sanding drum um, but I I sometimes it's hard to judge and um, the, the, the nut that looks uh, the right size or taller actually by the time you've measured how far down the slots go in fact isn't actually that much taller so it's a it's not a given but if as soon as I've um, as soon as I've thinned this down sideways and got it placed if it's too uh, it's too low we're going to have to think of a a way of boosting it up a tiny bit okay so removed by hand uh, now this is still a bit too wide so let's put the bits we want to keep we're going to get some spare saddle parts in a minute actually I'll do the saddle afterwards because there's no point undoing all of the these things at the moment because they've got strings going through them so I'll come back to that let's put the old string trees in there now I'm going to want to measure this existing or the existing nut for thickness and I'm going to just get it to the other one to the same so we've got 302 and we've got probably 310 325 so not too much different so I'm going to put it on there and do that. Three eighteen, three oh nine. What did we say? doing here three three oh five three sixteen three thirteen so we're nearly there and then chuck that one out of the way and bring a softer smoother one thingy one so we want three oh five not far off So at this sort of level you can then line it up like that and get a feel, it's just a fraction too chunky. So that's a good place to be in, we can just fine tune it on this fairly worn out block. But it gets there in the end. So what we obviously we want it to seat all the way in, there's no point it sort of sticking part of the way yeah so um, you know having 
some more guitars arriving. Um, some came in the post yesterday, some uh, came by, you know, dropped over by hand today. And uh, yeah, just got, got plenty to do, uh, which is great. Absolutely great to have enough work at this time of year. Need it, as I said last time, you know, the accountant's due any minute now, so uh, there's no secret that you get a rush of things you've got to pay for, and it's quite difficult, but you've got to do them. Okay, so this is where it sits at the moment, and it may be that this is too low. It looks nice. It's sitting in the slot all the way. This one's yeah, a fraction tall at this end. I probably just have to do a little tiny bit of alteration at this end. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm you know very feel very grateful and blessed that I've got I've got some good work in. Um, I, just, I feel very lucky that the uh, planar thickness uh, was taken away and repaired. Um, you know that sort of thing. So I'm just looking at this spacing here. It's probably going to be like that when the time is right. So what I sometimes do is, if I know where it is and I want it to fall, I will get this knife and cut up from there. So I've got just a little guide on each side. It's not the most accurate thing in the world, but it's a good start. So there's the tusk nut fitted. Like I said, if it's too low, I'll find out pretty quickly. Um, and then we have to rethink. Putting a, a shim or a boot on top of a, or on the bottom of a rounded uh, nut is difficult. Simple as that. It's, you know, we, we, we may have to think of shimming it with a flexible piece of cardboard, uh, not cardboard, a, flex, a more flexible piece of plastic, um, which will do the job. Um, but it's, it's not my first choice of material. But sometimes, if, if you, you, we need, a, we'd only need a tiny amount of lift. So a piece of thin, flexible plastic is that that will conform or mould to that radius is far better than, um, you know, not using that tusk nut or starting again or whatever, because that's the standard depth height of the 7.25 nut. This is the XL one, so it's got the. PTFE, 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 yeah, you know that slippery stuff in it. Uh, okay, well, at the moment, at the moment, okay, so this is new frets are taking up the slack here, so I'm going to just have to, I'm going to have to trust the measurement because we've got the. Uh, hmm, because we've got the stick, sticky one of these here, saddle uh, grub screws, I'm not necessarily going to be able to set this correctly for all strings. But what I can do, see it's trying to, it's stuck there, it's already, anyway, what I can do is I can get it close. And that actually is probably just about workable at this end, but I want it to be workable at both ends. So I'm going to try and replace these. Like I said before, um, this has a seized up thing. And actually, what I, I didn't want to put the brass things on, but actually, thinking about it now, uh, which is what I have to do, I may one by one change them. And the reason for that is simply to do the leveling, I need to be able to set my target, ideal target action. And of course, if I've got seized up grub screws and one of the frets is uh, one of the saddles is low compared to all the rest because I can't get it to the right target action, then that's not great. Um, so I think I'd better replace them, but I'll do it one by one so that I don't end up with these coiled strings tangling up again, running into each other. So, yeah, and then I'll have a sense, I'll have a much better idea whether that nut is... Um, workable or whether it's too low. 
It's funny because it's a, it's a, a Japanese guitar, so there's, and it's fairly old, so there's going to be some differences from the factory, modern factory fenders, American fenders. And quite often, when you're lucky, when I'm lucky, a, a change over a nut on a guitar like this from Fender will be a straight drop in, almost perfect. Um, and to be honest, that's about the only time where you know, Tusk gets it dead right, because they make so many different ones, they can't get it right all the time. And a lot of it is a, a bit hit and miss. Now this is, at the moment, this is looking marginal. So uh, uh, I still won't have a verdict on it until I've got the, the other saddles on and we've raised the playing action up to the correct height. Um, but I am now immediately starting to think, OK, what's the material I'm going to use for this uh, shimming? Probably less than a tenth of a millimetre, so it doesn't have to be a great piece of hard plastic. It could be a little flexible piece of plastic from somewhere. Um, um, the problem is, is it can't be another piece of tusk, because I, I won't find a curved piece of tusk to fit to the bottom of it like that. It just won't happen. Yeah, so these are touching the touching the uh, um, first fret. Uh, so I will have to go on a little hunt at some point for a suitable material. Um, I won't know how much further I've got to shim it by. Sometimes I can shim it using copper tape. That's not a bad material to do. Sometimes even a flexible little piece of sandpaper is enough um, enough to lift it up. Okay, so these are all pretty much touching the ground. But So I think to have any sense of what's really going on, I think I'm going to have to go into replace the saddles mode one by one. Uh, and that's a, a bit of a, a mess about. Um, I do like these. They're such handsome things. I think they work great with you know the look of a blonde strap. So it's uh, to me it feels like an upgrade to have those on. Okay, so now I'm going to need some uh, take this off. Da -da, da -da, da -da. So I'll have a bag ready to drop them into. Of course, I'm going to still have to take the string off each one to thread it back through, but it's all worth it. So first one, undo, undo. Pull this straight, make it a bit easier. So off comes the that one into the bag with it. And then on goes the first of the new ones. All fresh and clean. <coughs> fresh, clean and lovely. That's got to go through there, which isn't easy. So nice and slow it keeps us. <laughs> anyway, I've had some fun this last day or so, um, taking photographs and of a, a pothole that I ran into and uh, getting ready to claim some money back off the council for such a damaging, dangerous hole in the ground. But, you know, they're really funny. They they make a point of saying um, on their website, pretty much, we have got a very successful record of defending against these things. <laughs> you know, like, so every step of the way, they put so many documents that you have to give them, like your insurance tax, MOT, uh, Photographs of the the hole, the, the pothole, uh, copies of your story, versions of your story of how it happened, so on and so forth. You know, all with a sort of, I guess, with a view of not paying you if they can help it. Swines. Anyway, I'm still going through with it. I'm going to, I'm going to darn well put in my claim, and that's that. So I'm just going to try and see, first of all, an approximation on this one, where it sits and how 
far away from getting a um, uh, how far away the nut is from working so I think it is a bit not going to work frankly yeah hitting the hitting the first fret there so we have to shim it so that's about 1.2 um, wow nice looking thingy um, yeah it's gonna we're gonna need to shim this it's it's just it's a very it's very little so I think what we're going to find is that the way to shim this to make it work is going to be with tin tin foil, copper foil. Um, and I'm going to show you how I do it. Um, well, no, let me see if there's... I'm going to look for flexible plastic, but I don't think there's going to be anything very suitable. So I'm just going to slack these off first of all to get the nut out. Um, because I'd rather we then shim it a little bit extra over the top and then be left to uh, um, cut very slightly into the saddles if we have to do anything at all. Okay, so this bit, I tell you what, I'm probably going to stop because I just am. This is going to be fiddly and boring and slow. Let me stop um, and I'll come back when I've resized this and got all of those on and then save you just sitting and watching it. See you in a bit. Ooh, suits you, sir. Look at that, lovely. Right, well, we've got mm, a boosted up nut. I had to cannibalize the original one to get this one done. A little bit of tweaking to do and afterwards, but a deeper slot than expected. So not a brilliant, mm, not an easy thing. Uh, always the way. Nothing's ever straightforward, is it? So what I'm going to do now is going to get on with the fret leveling and the fun part fingers crossed the fun part uh, after the after the what's that thing the refret so the idea now is to is for this to kind of just beautifully come together come together right now come together in a, uh, a delicious fondant uh, thingy of uh, level frets that's what I'm trying to say so it's not level yet, of course, but it will be. And that's a good calibration. I like it. I'm calibrated for the high E track. Ready, move off the thingy. <laughs> move off the string. Here we go. So it's going to, it'll show me up, show me up, show up pretty quickly for me what the, uh, oops, uneven frets are in this pile of things. And I expect there to be some, so it's not going to be any surprise or problem. So it's going to show up low spots. I checked the relief, by the way, before I started doing this, which is, of course, a very, a very important thing to do when leveling. So we've got the action set where I want it and the relief set where I want it. So. Now this is a seven and a quarter inch radius and the one thing we know about that is that it will not play at a low action. So I can see a couple of uneven spots here which are kicking up dust which is okay. There's a high spot up at the very end here. So my thing to do now will be to check the individual notes. That's good. So that's uh, that's been done to an action of 1.5, just over 1.5, which is as low as I'd probably like to go with uh, this uh, 7.25. Obviously, you know those who, if you who've watched this before, know that I will go to 1.2 on a nine and a half inch radius or flatter, but not in the case of 7.25 it's just pushing it too far so there's one low fret in here which is um, it's okay it's not so low it's going to cause any long-term problems so there's the first fret first fret first track done I'm going to now go across to the B track keeping the same calibration 
Um, as often tends to be that uh, when there's a an old, not old, uh, a well played fretboard can tend to roll over with age um, and so sometimes refretting you can struggle a bit with the fret ends as opposed to the rest of the frets but again I'm seeing a high patch here, a low patch there and a high one there um, which is okay so again we're now going to try out our number two track or B track make it play tiny bit more at that top end for my likings so this should be all good So these were 1.3 high frets, which of course were a lot higher than it started out as. Um, so I had enough kind of spare built-in room for leveling, which is what I always aim to do. So now I'm going to calibrate for the G track. The G track is the one that does or doesn't allow us to bend high E string notes across into the G track. So, um, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to bend this. Um, yeah. So if you're gonna, if it's gonna choke out, it's gonna choke out in the G track. And by virtue of the geometry, for a given playing action, uh, the strings will choke out on the G track because you bend it across sooner when you have a tight radius like a 7.25 than it will with a flatter radius like a 9.5 or a 12. So we will be listening out to see in a minute whether the bends across into the G-track are problematical, problematic, or whether they go across. The setting of the last fret action a little bit higher than uh, the, the the target I would set for a lower, sorry, for a flatter radius, is a concession to the limitations of that geometry. Just there's no way you can get them to play at the same low action, unfortunately. So yeah, we're showing up a quite high flat flat fret there on number four, um, and a crop of high ones right at the top. But yeah, we shall tame them all. Now this feels quite low up this end right now, so we've got 1.5, so we probably need to be a tiny bit higher on the G than that. Yeah, that's good, that's good. So now what I'm listening for is... Blimey. So we're just choking out there. Oh, on that bend. So I'm going to do a tiny bit more leveling on the top here of the G track with a view to just easing out those that little choke. We want it to do any we want it to do the bends we want it to do at the chosen action. So I'm just going to run it on this high part of the fret. Sorry, high part of the neck, I should say. I, I've got such delicate fingers, I really can't bend that well. There you go. Freed it up. Ah! Oh! Now we're going to calibrate for the D track. OK. 
calibrate for the D. So after this bit of the game, whoops, how can we see what we're doing? After this, we're on to uh, crowning and polishing the frets. Now, realistically, it's Friday night. It's Friday night, and the time is right, and it's getting later. So I may finish all that sanding and polishing bit off if I if I can force myself to stay stay behind. The dust always looks scary uh, on a blonde neck, obviously. A little bit more of the 12th fret. A little focus on the 12th fret. <laughs> And then move on. Okay, calibrate for the A. So, my weekend looks like tomorrow night, tomorrow evening, I'm going to rewire one of the uh, left handed firebirds. Um, finished it. It was the first one I wired up. I thought I got it right and it's turned out that something ain't working quite right. So um, rather than try and poke around I'm going to uh, pull out the components, fit new ones. Just be, I hate reusing existing and I, I'll repurpose it some other time in a parts caster or something you know never been used. They're, they're perfectly good CTS pots or something like that, but I don't like reusing them when I'm putting right a mistake I've made with wiring. I mean, it probably it isn't actually that complicated a mistake, so I probably could sort it out, but um, I'll see to see how easy it is. Uh, so don't forget, this is a from fresh from refretting this um, leveling, so it's a brand new. So a little bit of a sizzle around the middle, sizzle around the middle. So I'm just going to float it in there and let it do its shape shifting, wonderful thing. Yeah, so tomorrow night is the left-handed firebird rewire or fix wiring. Um, and then on Sunday, I hopefully, I'll either be getting on to um, the Made in Mexico, that's Nick's fender. That's pretty much there. I'm just, let's have a look. Actually, that's a fraction low. That's possibly why. Um, yeah, so Nick's Made in Mexico uh, strat on s s Sunday. That's about right. Um, yeah, and then next week, my God, I've got, well, I've got to finish that guitar, the Made in Mexico, then I go on to the Made in America strat, they're all three refrets, so this is the first of the three. Um, and then after that, I'm on to uh, some, some Hofner 
very thin, so which hopefully I won't have too much to do. A uh, a rally three three five, and uh, yeah, a couple of other things. Yeah, lots lots of things at a home waiting to be done. And then there's uh, oh, a flying V, Chinese flying V to upgrade and set up uh, for Andrew. And then after that, uh, probably some more flying Vs flying in, along with probably uh, another Firebird or two. There seem to be quite a few coming in from Andrew. But there we are. Oh, nice out tuning thing. Uh, let's get a, a tuning fork. Okay, I think that's it with the leveling. We'll get these bits away. We will now move on to the recrowning part of the game. So for that, we will say thank you to these sacrificial strings, and we will remove them. Now these are tens, so we have to be conscious of that when we come to uh, restring. I'm going to cut these off so they come off easier and don't get them caught tangled up down there. There we are. And out through the back. Oh well, come on out you come. <laughs> Perhaps I should have Taking the cover off the back first. I really should should have. Let's do it. It makes no sense to leave that on the back. Also, it's good to take this off at this point because I can... Also, a bit overdone, doesn't want to come up. Uh, I can also do a check for what the finish is inside here. So these are a bit worn out. Oh, years of taking it on and off, I guess. That's quite, quite normal. There we go. Come on. Right, we have the strings off. Get rid of them. So stage, next stage is to um, re-crown the frets. Now the question is, do I, at this point, do I I think we'd probably be better off masking it off at this point. Now, if you remember, we're hoping the Japanese finish withstands the withstands the um, tape. If it doesn't, then whoopee, we're into a, a whole refinish scenario. But we can't really do the fret crowning and polishing without uh, taping off. So it's a boring thing and it's a slight risk but like I say I've never had a, a made in Japan fender 
shed its skin uh, the way the Americans have or the Mexicans have. And even then that's only rare, so it's not the end of the world. Anyhow. So boring, 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 boring. Um, I mean, there are millions of videos of me crowning frets. So if I mask this off, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll show you crowning this big flat one here that needs a bit of work. Um, and then I will shut off the camera and come back when I've polished all the frets out um, and we're kind of ready to just restring because Otherwise, it'll go on for too long and you'll get bored. So there's the one I'm going to recrown, And I use my faithful Stumac tool. You can come in here and see just how easy it is. Is that the black one there? Yes. So I will get medium size because they're tall and tall and something. They're niche. Uh, there we are. That one there. There it is. So... And the idea is to use this tool from side to side just to grind off or scrape off, file off the edges of the flat spot that I've made, resulting in a little thin line of marker down the middle of the fret, which you can probably see in the different, different light conditions there. So that's kind of done. And that, that's, that's probably the worst one of the lot, but it it crowns up nicely. So I'm going to hold off that, come back in a minute um, when we're ready to finish off. If I can do it tonight, I think I will. Let's be, let's be, let's be something tenacious. So we're kind of near to where we've got to, got to want to get to. So um, frets polished out, recrowned, polished out. Um, interestingly, we did get a bit of flake out on the edge here, and it's over here. Uh, gonna have to repair that. Neep, 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 neep. There it is. Look at that. A little bit of flake came off with the tape, so I'm gonna repair that. Uh, got some, got some poly. I've done a test on the inside of there. It's polyurethane, so I'm going to do take this home now. I'm gonna build up a little bit along the edges here, along the edges of the frets, and we'll be kind of ready to restring it, which I'll do at home because um, that's really all there is to do. Um, I think I'm just going to check the jack socket because I have a feeling it was OK, but a part of my mind was telling me that I needed to replace this one. Typically, I didn't bring my notes with me, but that's OK. I will find out, but I'll take it back with me and this will be the sort of the last bit. I know it's not very satisfying to kind of stop here in mid do, but it's just the way it is. So let's check, make sure that this is okay. <laughs> Train, there is no. <laughs> so that's not being off, on and off. You never do it right. Hmm, I have a feeling that this is dodgy. Um, and I did get me a whole load of things for it. I can find out where they are. Somewhere in this bag there are a whole set of jack sockets. There they are. <sighs> What I might do is I might take this home with me and do it at home, but I will meanwhile check, just have a quick look under here. Got a little bit of a crackle there, which I didn't like. Gosh, that's a bit on the short side. Uh, it looks all right, but it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a cheap. I probably should do it now, shouldn't I? While I'm here, come on, Samuel, do the thing. 
And what's the point of getting it all set up at home? Mm. So, mm, mm, mm. yeah, it was a bit on the crackly side, or intermittent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it up, do it up, replace it, um, and I'm going to do the replacement with a little bit of low density Fred Lock, Fred Lock Holiday. Um, I have this all parts, sorry, switchcraft jack socket because this one, this other one isn't switchcraft. That should fit in good, good, that should fit good, yeah. Um, let's put a bit of, I'm sorry if you can see what I'm doing here. Um, it's not very, not, the, not a very the best look at everything, that will probably do. I'm sorry, it's a bit casual. <coughs> Probably about time I bought a new one of these. So this is a low dense, low strength thread lock, and it just helps to stop things like this jack socket from spinning about in free space. It's always difficult to get this to bite on to begin with. So that's all needed doing on here really, additionally, that's the only problem with the electrics. And then we shall be on our way out of here for the Friday night. Relax at home. Okay. Sometimes you do things, for example, you, you um, improve you get a replacement, good quality replacement. It's not uncommon that doing that puts you in a bit of crappy position because the replacement is either slightly bigger or has a slightly bigger lug sticking out and the thing suddenly won't close or some such thing. Now these, um, by the way, these, these screws are a bit, they're a bit, getting starting to get worn out some of these things. So, and they're odd replacements. So I'm going to replace with some slightly newer ones. Which, we, which will be a bit bigger. So I'll just pour them out ready for putting things on. Okay, so here we have the last little thingy of the thingy. The last little hurrah. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I was listening to some ABBA before I came back on, I know. Forgive me, won't you? I was enjoying it too. Mm. And not that much heat coming off of this. Better. Thank you. I had a different tip on the other day and it was pretty good for putting lots of heat into pots. But this one's a finer one. Come on. Really doesn't want to come out. This one. Uh. Okay, we'll put that in with these spares. Why not? Just keep it, the original bits in there. In you go. And we'll also put in these little funny bright coloured silver ones. Okay, Doki. We've got a bear and we've got a, a bear. Grr. We've got a bear and we've got an oith. The oith is going in here. Getting something to hold steady. Steady. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I don't want it to go too far in. That will do. Stay in there. Gonna hold it for me, maybe. Uh, I tell you what, let's push it in. Get it a long way in. 
and then we will cut the excess off when the time is right. Sorry about this. Yeah, so a bit of work on the finish at a nice, slow, relaxed pace and all will be good. For some reason, this is not transferring the heat very well. Come on. Thank you. Make sure it's up. Cutters. There they are. And this is just heated up a bit more. I'm going to just redo that. Make sure it's a good joint, baby. Okay, so um, at home I will do some uh, finish work and then when it's all done I will polish it out gently with a car paste or some, I'll take some, I'm taking some, um, uh, those things home with me. <laughs> Micro mesh and I will do that at home. Mm -hmm. All will be well. And then I'll put some tins on there at home and that will be, I think, pretty much everything sorted. have some better sized screws. A bit more grip. Uh, I'm not sure where I put the, uh, the long ones. I think I'll stick with these replacements. Wow, okay, that one goes in there like so. Hmm. Of course, let us do a quick test. Nice. Oh, lovely. A good, strong jack socket. Ta-da! Right, you're off, you're off, you're off. Bit of cleaning up on there, and what we'll do is we'll put this cover on the back with some fresh ones because these holes are a bit big now. And that will be it. Oh, okay, miss all together. So the torque setting is on one. And the secret is to always hold the uh, screw to support the, the bit when it's starting off so it doesn't fall off. Okay, that's that for now. So um, let me just make sure I've got some tens, which I have here. Only balls, tens, and that's it for tonight. Um, I'll bring these with me since they're leftover spare bits. Um, and that, sorry about the kind of rambling all over the place in this, but I think that's going to be, it just needs that little bit of finish on the side to tidy up. For some reason, I cannot get this bag to close up. Now I can. So those are going in the box, that's going in the box. 
nothing else I need to take with it. It's all sorted, old frets gone, new frets in, a bit of finish to do, and then string up and play. Lovely. So thank you very much for your time watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, pick up. Yeah, there we go. Beautiful looking thing. Now with refret and some brass saddles, and we'll have a little bit of finish, tinted finish on the side there. And that will be lovely. And then some new strings, and we're ready to go. Okay, see so you uh, for the next refret, starting t tomorrow? No, starting Sunday. See you soon. So I thought I would just um, show you, show you what I'm doing at the homestead. Oh my God. Um, of course, I can't do this very well. Or maybe I can hold this with one hand. It'll stand up. Yeah, if I'm careful. Okay, so as you saw before, especially here, see that little ditch there? That was a little piece of flake out. Okay, so I'm basically, I'm using my wipe on poly. Is this satin or? Oh, it's clear gloss, this one. Okay, that's fine. Minwax wipe on poly. This is the water based one. Um, hard to get in the UK. And a bit of stain in there, or crimson amber, making this sort of egg yolky. It's quite fairly dark, but anyway, so it's a poly stain. And what I'm doing on this all the way, in fact, I don't do it this way around. Hold on, spare me, excuse me. Let's do it this way. <laughs> stain there, do there, do that. Right, uh, very hard to do whilst thinking. So I'll come to the bit that fell out, the flaky bit, a bit later. But what I'm doing, I started last night late. Um, when I, <coughs> sorry, this table is a mess. When I came back from the workshop, um, and I'm normally holding this so I get a better view than I'm currently getting of it. But So I'm sort of just looking over the top of the camera at the moment. So what I'm doing is I'm just painting on some uh, finish here, like so. Was that the hole, or was it on the other side? No, oh my god, I can't see now, I've lost my bearings. The hole is, the hole is, the hole is on this side. Yeah, I've just covered it up there. Sorry, view is terrible. Anyhow, so what I do on this is every half an hour or so, if I can remember, I come along here and I just paint along the edge here. And this is building up some finish. And this water-based stuff is brilliant. It really does dry up after about half an hour. So it's incredibly useful. It, by, by midday, I could sand this back with wet sanding uh, and buff it out if I needed to do it. it <coughs> excuse me. It's a, uh, you'd think it might need days to sort of finish, but it's um, some, I suppose being formulated for this wipe on thing, maybe it's, sorry, maybe it's meant to uh, go off or set quicker. But of course the thing about, uh, there's a bit of hair in there. We don't want that, do we? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, nope, 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 nope. Yes, hold on, bear with me, hair with me. We don't want this hair in here. It was in the last coat, so it's coming out now, please. Come on. Sorry, I, I, as you can tell, I haven't got enough hands to make this plan work. Come on, out you come. I think that's out. Okay, just as well to catch that early before it get stuck there forever. So I'm just putting this on as like a little bead along the edge. And then what I tend to do is go back and uh, redistribute it a little bit. So I'm taking off the bulk of the material off the brush. And then I tend to sort of give it a bit of a, a spread out um, and I'm kind of pushing and pulling this blasted teeth towel out of the way. Um, so I'm kind of just redistributing a little bit. And the main thing is what is I don't want it to go over the 
uh, onto the fingerboard side, so that's kind of important. The light helps me a little bit see what I'm doing, um, but I'm just sort of spreading it out. It isn't perfect, but the idea is that I'll build up a bit of extra material and uh, so I can, no, I can't really do it the other way around. Um, sorry. Oh, blimey. Sorry. Oh, blimey. Stay there. I'll come here. Now, <clears throat> this isn't going to work this way around. Okay, there goes my towel. So, um, I actually can't film the next side. But anyway, the thing I just want to show is that's what I'll carry on doing and then I'll leave it for another half hour or so. Um, and you can see it's obviously it's not smooth, but that gives me a sort of foundation that I can then carefully sand. And I'll probably do it with um, about, let's see if I can get this to prop up a minute. Just so hold on a second. If I can, um, if I can sand it back with about a thousand grit to begin with. You stay there. Ho ho. Yeah, nothing, nothing harsher than a thousand grit. I've got plenty of time. Um, and then what I'll do is go to 1500 and then I'll use this <clears throat> micro mesh set and just being very careful all the time to smooth it out. And so when I get to where it's level, then I'll be ready to um, put some car polishing paste on it. So I'm going over the the end of the nut here as well. Um, and it doesn't matter too much if it kind of goes down the side of the neck a little bit because it, it goes on top of the original poly very well. Um, and once you've, basically once you've sanded it back out and buffed it, it's very, very hard to see <clears throat> tell the difference. Um, you can sometimes, you, you, on certain finishes, certain types of poly, you can just about make it out, but it's very hard to differentiate. So you get a very nicely finished um, edge, which is a nice finishing touch because, you know, having done the setup and everything but restringing, stretching and uh, intonating, which I can do here, um, everything else about the refret is done and it just means that this bit doesn't add, it doesn't drag on. So I, my target was to have this guitar ready for Larry to collect first thing next week. And with this, it's not like it has to hang up and dry for weeks like uh, nitro cellulose ideally does. With this, um, by the time this is uh, dry overnight. What I'll do is I'll put a few more coats on, and then I'll I'll put a few more edgy bits on, and then I will dry it overnight tonight, and then tomorrow I will end up sanding it uh, and polishing it out, and so that I can put it together tomorrow night. Sorry, not put it together. Put it yeah, put it back on. That's that's what I have to do. Put put it back on tomorrow night, and. Um, add the strings and be stretched out, intonated and ready to go. Because it's probably not going to go back up to the workshop for that. I probably won't film that last bit, but you know, it's I've got enough on to I mean it's uh, it's not convenient to take it back up there because I've got other things to do. So you can see the fresh stuff on there. As, as I say, there's some little bits kind of building up a bit more than you'd want them to like. There's a bit there which you may or may not be able to see. You know, of course. Yeah, just a little bit of a blob there. But that will come out with the sanding as long as I'm careful. So at this point, I can move things out of the way. And I can turn it over and put it safely 
face down to dry for half an hour without anything getting in the way. And then, yeah, it's easy to do. So, um, I mean, that was mixed up yesterday and it it's not being covered overnight. Normally I'd cover it, but because of the shape of the container, I didn't. So it's thickened up a little bit, but that's no problem with this. Um, it'll just be ready, ready to use. So I got this in uh, from America. Um, I, I used it once before somebody recommended it when I first started doing this. And, and many of my guitar necks of my older guitars over there somewhere were made or were finished in this stuff. So uh, if you can get it, it's really, really easy to use. Hand rubbed beauty. Um, I it, it was so hard to get that I ended up buying four of these or maybe even six. And I think it was four of these in a pack. And it was you know obviously quite a bit, but by the time you added the postage for four, this I knew at the time this would be about four or five years of requirement for me. So it's it's always here. Um, I think it's probably my last of four now, so I have gone through it. I did one whole body finished in that, a Les Paul shaped body, but it was hard work. I mean, satisfying, but hard work to do. Um, but the beauty is, is you can do it in your home environment and you can finish whole necks in it. it, it I, I wouldn't paint it for the neck, I would rub it on, but quite thickly, and then, you know, sort of sand it back at the end. <clears throat> now, it's not ever quite as flat and perfect as a sprayed on, uh, as even as a sprayed on finish, of course. Um, but actually, if you're careful, I've finished many a nice feeling neck with it because and the neck's pretty easy to sand back because of the shape, somehow it really likes being sanded back. Flat surfaces like this are less convincing. You see, you know, you'll see a bit more um, undulation uh, in a hand applied finish, whereas obviously on this it looks really dead flat and even like that. You wouldn't quite get it, as, possibly not get it as good as that. But again, it's down to how much you sand it and the kind of block you sand with. But for the rounded parts of necks, it's really good. Anyway, that was it. I just thought I'd add that to the mix as the sort of final part or nearly the final part in this process for your info um if you can't get this stuff you can get um there there do some research on what alternatives you can use because i'm not sure there's anything special in here there they're absolutely right about this it is fast drying but i'm not sure there's really anything particularly special about it um and lots of people have views on or stories on how they made their own um just by diluting it somewhat or diluting regular poly or whatever um but it's uh <clears throat> it's really really easy to use and very forgiving and also like i say you can do this and then go and go and do some other work or whatever and come back to this shortly and carry on anyway thanks for watching see you again